All right, and we are live. Welcome to the Post Shanghai Institutional e staking online forum. I am so excited to host this event today. Um, we have three hours packed full of amazing discussions today all around uh, Ethereum staking and the impact of the Ethereum Shanghai upgrade, which enables withdrawals and fulfills the full realization of the proof of stake vision for Ethereum. My name is Mirko Schmiedel. I'm CEO and co founder of stakingrewards.com. I'm staking since 2014, and uh, basically I missed out on staking rewards in 2017, and that's why I uh, hit up my brother. So we created stakingrewards.com together, and since then helping people to succeed in staking. Um, now the Ethereum Shanghai upgrade um, basically changes the dynamics of staking forever. It's the full realization of the proof of stake vision, and we feel like there are so many opportunities and also risks that are still uncovered around Ethereum staking, especially now with like withdrawals being enabled, um, that we uh, sit together and thought about, okay, how can we help to bring uh, more people into staking? How can we drive institutional adoption? So we created this event and um, packed the next three hours full of like amazing discussions, alpha spicy discussions, um, and help institutional investors to get into staking who, who are looking to buy and stake Ethereum. So stay with us, uh, stay engaged. Um, we have uh, amazing discussions today. Um, and um, let me just uh, show the agenda here. Um, we are sponsored by ClayStack, uh, leading liquid staking solution on Polygon, and EtherFi, uh, one of the hottest non-custodial liquid staking protocols who gained more than 5 million TVL uh, in less than two weeks. Um, so that's very impressive. And what's going to happen today, we're going to start off um, on a panel about the future of e-staking um, and explore the current state of institutional adoption for Ethereum and how staking can be a driver for adoption. So this is very exciting. Um, then we'll be followed by a keynote from Allison from the Proof of Stake Alliance talking about uh, staking regulation, the current state, and um, the outlook as well. Then we'll dive into liquid staking. Um, we have an amazing lineup, uh, basically all the leading liquid staking protocols here, and we'll explore the current and future landscape of Ethereum liquid staking in the institutional space, including its benefits, risks, and opportunities for the DeFi space. Um, then we have a special guest with us today, Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation, who will talk about the impact and opportunities of withdrawals for Ethereum staking. And um, then we'll be following it by like a, a panel on the staking compliance, um, talking about the regulatory as well as practical challenges hindering broader institutional adoption for Ethereum staking. And then as a final showdown, we have a panel on staking innovations, um, specifically DVT and restaking, um, and we'll explore how staking innovations can drive institutional adoption and how to prevent potential risks of centralization that might arise with these innovations as well. Um, on a special note, before we kick off the first panel, um, just yesterday we've announced the Staking Summit 2023. So it's going to take place on the 10th and 11th of November in Istanbul in Turkey. So really excited. Um, make sure to grab your early bird tickets, which we've just released, um, if you want to be part of the discussion where staking goes next. And now uh, we're going to kick off the first panel. I'm super excited um, to have with us today um, the uh, moderator of the panel, Meltem from CoinShares, um, who's a partner for institutions. Uh, welcome here. Um, then we have with us Marcos from Bridge Tower Capital, um, running operations for a lot of institutions, doing staking there. Uh, Julom, uh, head of institutional sales at Coinbase, um, and Jim McDonald, um, who's building a test and um, a managed staking service for institutions as well. So, and uh, obviously, uh, Michael from Bitcoin Swiss, um, who's building crypto products for institutions as well. So, uh, I'm so excited. Uh, we have uh, 700 registrants today. Um, let's make this a, a full success, and I'm uh, keen for you to kick it off, Malcolm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marco. It's great to be here with such a great panel and excited to kick this off. So one thing I always like about panel discussions, I'm sure that all of us in here agree directionally on many things, but it will be the details where we get a chance to disagree and maybe delve into some of the different perspectives each of us have on the future of institutional staking based on where we sit in the ecosystem and based on the way that our businesses operate. So we have about 
30 minutes. We've already gone through our bios, our intros, so we won't spend much more time on that. But let's start maybe uh, in a great way for everyone here to sort of introduce their business. Let's start by just chatting about how investors should view staking. Um, Every network in the crypto ecosystem that offers staking of some type is quite different in terms of its construction, how staking works on that network. And most networks, uh, you know, you're earning pro rata inflation because there's an ongoing increase in the token supply. Uh, we sometimes describe staking as yield, which I think is confusing because yield in the context of traditional finance typically means something quite different. Yield typically connotates some sort of risk is being taken for the added reward uh, of earning uh, returns. Um, so this language is very confusing, but maybe the best place to start is just by each of us articulating how staking rewards show up in our business and how we articulate it to investors. So I'll just kick it off at CoinShare is very simple. We build and uh, offer structured products to the market in the form of exchange traded products today. And the way we make staking easy is many of our products have the staking yield built right in. That means there's zero fees on our products. So if you own one of our staking products, you don't pay any fees, unlike a traditional product. And on top of that, for many of our products, we're actually able to give you some portion of that reward back in the form of an increase in the number of certificates you own at the end of each period, whether that's that's month or quarter. Um, so that's how we do it. It's very simple. And for us, really, the goal is how do we make it as easy as possible for someone to go to their brokerage account, buy something with one click of a button and get exposure not only to the underlying and be fundamentally long that underlying, but also to participate in the staking side of um, the, the network. So very simple. Marcus, maybe we'll go to you next. How does staking show up in your business and how do you articulate the benefits of staking to some of your clients today who may be confused by some of the language and some of the syntax around staking? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Now, looking at staking and, you know, we just saw the merge a couple of months ago. And I need to say, I think the whole Ethereum core developer team did an amazing job, right? That was that was not skipping any beat. I think it's like a like a Swiss watch. It was perfectly executed, and this quality, right? Is this this shipping quality code? This is currently increasing a lot of certainty and confidence into Ethereum, in particular by the institutions. And, um, you know, also with the merge, right, officially we switched to proof of stake and we all know it, energy consumption got reduced by 99.5%, which is huge. A lot of our clients, and it's also one of our core values, uh, carbon neutrality, ESG compliance, and really at the end, saving the planet is super important. And um, the fact that we now are more or less able to be ESG compliant with this, this hardware operation, right? So blockchain needs software and hardware to operate. This is a big, big switch in the, at the end in the, in the market. And, um, you know, in particular, Bridgestar, we are not utilizing any cloud uh, solutions. We have our own bare metal servers in multiple locations, including here, the beautiful Switzerland. And we are only sourcing 100% renewable energy. So this last piece of energy, which is still used to operate these servers, we're also trying to have it as carbon neutral as possible. We developed our own carbon footprint dashboard to even break down every ETH and every block which was produced to the energy and the carbon saved, not emitted in our case. And in general, you know, we are targeting our staking services also for the institutions. We just launched, uh, launched and announced two weeks ago our platform, which is allowing investors to access Lido, so liquid staking powered by Lido, in a complete permissioned and custodial manner. And we see more and more of these regulated KYC enabled solutions coming. And I think this is one of the additional things which are currently really enabled. Uh -oh. uh -oh. <laughs> KYC enabled solutions. I feel like that's a big red sort of uh, Saxon going off in my brain. We should come come back to that. Um, Marcus, when you sort of describe uh, staking, how do you articulate ETH staking in particular to your clients, your investors in terms of what is what is the benefit? Yeah, you know, at the end, um, I think you, you need to start also at uh, you have a seat at the table. Right. So you're more or less securing the network. You have more or less a voting power in most of the networks in the governance processes. So having a seat at the table is really important. Looking from an investment and regulatory point of view, 
uh, yes, you could argue that it's kind of an investment contract. You're locking your funds for a certain period. Um, we all know these discussions are ongoing, but at the end, um, you know, you're losing out. If you're not staking, you would lose out on this, this staking rewards and the inflation. Looking at the theorem, yes, we are currently deflationary uh, with all the gas which are burned. So I think you see a double benefit. You're participating in the, the growth of the underlying blockchain, plus you're getting a yield on top for locking your tokens for a certain time. Got it. Uh, Jerome, maybe we'll come to you next. So Coinbase obviously have a very large business. You touch a wide segment of customers ranging from retail. I myself, avid Coinbase user, have been for many years, but you go all the way up to the stack um, and you serve institutions as well as crypto companies um, who may be using your platform. So when you talk about staking, how do you articulate it to, to your clients and what are some of the key sort of talking points um, as to why they should be staking, why staking is so important, particularly from that institutional perspective. Absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, as we could see already with the, the first two participants, uh, th there are various products in the market that are called staking, and, and many of them are working very differently. Uh, at Coinbase, we're really focusing on what we're calling core staking services, which are protocol-based and on-chain staking. Um, First, uh, the definition that we have internally at Conbay is that what is staking. Uh, to me, staking serves as a similar function to mining in that the process by which a network participant uh, is getting selected to add to the latest batch of the transaction to the blockchain and earn some crypto in exchange. So basically, as Marcus mentioned, you're helping provide security to the, to the network and you're receiving rewards in, in exchange. Um, staking is allowing anyone, anywhere to contribute to the security of a blockchain and be rewarded for these efforts. Uh, but there are different ways to, to, to participate to, to the staking activities. Uh, and typically an average crypto user, as well as the, I would say, institutional beginners uh, are using a service provider like Coinbase or uh, Bitcoin Swiss to, uh, to do the, the staking on their behalf. Uh, Coinbase, for instance, will keep the servers running, the software up to date, uh, and help manage uh, a lot of uh, the things involving validators and so on. Um, now, what is important is, uh, however a crypto user decides to, to stake, uh, it is going to be very important for the ecosystem uh, and allow proof of stake blockchains to operate uh, seamlessly. Um, the way I'm mentioning it to my client is, you have different ways to stake with us. Uh, you can uh, use uh, Coinbase Prime directly through the UI uh, and having your assets uh, still in cold storage, click uh, and, and stake your assets directly uh, just with, uh, with, uh, with the UI. The other thing that we offer through Coinbase Cloud is the possibility to manage your own validators using the infrastructure that we provide to, to our clients and for them to do, to do more on, on, on their own. At this point in time, we offer staking for 10 different assets within Coinbase Prime and roughly 20, 20 additional within Coinbase Cloud. Very good. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, Michael, we'll go to you next to Bitcoin Suisse. Um, what are the ways in which you are focused on offering staking to your clients? And when you talk about staking, particularly with individuals who may not be as familiar with some of the functions of staking that Jerome described, how do you sort of approach that conversation to help them understand why staking is important, why they should participate in this activity? Because it is, I think, quite novel. Most of us, when we buy a financial product, you know, we don't have any expectation of doing work. We just are providing risk capital. So I think this idea that we're actually providing security to a network through pledging our tokens as part of this proof of stake mechanism is, is quite novel, quite new. And I'll be very honest, sometimes for me even, it's challenging to understand how staking functions in all of these different networks. So how do you, how do you approach that, especially across a business as diverse as Bitcoin Suisse? Yes, uh, thank you. Great question. So at Bitcoin Suisse, we're serving institutions and high network individuals with two staking uh, products. But firstly, the rewards, that's quite a challenge to, to explain, but at the core, it is explainable and that's ex important for institutional. So it's clear where it's coming from, the main part coming from the inflation or the, the redistribution of the rewards as a result of securing the blockchain, but you also get the transaction fees, the tips, and uh, we also pass on any minor extractable value that there, there might be there. It is getting complicated, but still you can explain uh, that this is part of securing the network. It's legitimate 
and it's different from sometimes other uses of uh, staking where it's all about locking up your tokens. So the, what we consider staking is really in conjunction with the proof of stake blockchain. And to make this accessible, we have uh, two products. One is our classical staking product, which is very close to uh, running validators. You are aligned on the 32 ETH that you have to bring in. It's, uh, it's, it's no, no abstraction. It's, uh, it's, it's almost like, like native and Bitcoin Swiss provides the whole value chain. So it's custodial. We have our own custody system. We have our own validators and we run it end to end. So a very little counterparty risk from institutional perspective. But uh, at least for now, you have the lockups or uh, exit queues after the Shanghai upgrade. And in addition to this, uh, we announced that we are part of the Liquid Collective, providing a second way into staking, which is uh, fully fractional, not bound to the 32, but then involving other parties that are organized by the Liquid Collective and the Luvial, where Coinbase is also uh, a participant. And that creates different advantages, like uh, uh, we are just... Uh, seeing the secondary markets developing and for institutions who want to build bankable products on top of the staking this is very important to have the high liquidity get in and out to increase and decrease the size of the product got it thank you michael and then jim last but not least um attestant you have slightly different model um you are i think purely focused on supporting uh these these proof of stake networks so tell us a bit about how you talk to your clients about staking um and the types of clients you're you're seeing coming into your business sure thank you so attestant is uh purely focused on ethereum so we don't look at a lot of the other chains out there. Obviously, a lot of chains do do proof of stake. But they do it in very different ways. Ethereum's pretty much unique in terms of how it's doing the work it's doing. As a result of that, what we found is that we've seen, if you will, waves of investors come in. So, you know, the initial ones were the true believers, all the ones who staked before Genesis. By the way, congratulations, guys. You've done pretty well out of this. Um, you know, they, they, they trusted, they believed. They went in and they, they ran a system that had no real concept of how it would work in terms of actually securing an execution chain in terms of how you would ever get money back out of it. We saw probably a, a, a little break for a, a month or two after that until people enough people decided that, yeah, this thing seems to be working. And then we saw a, a significant second wave come in. And they were the people who were comfortable now that they've seen the technology work, but again, without those financials. So when you go and look at, again, our customers, normally institutions, high net worth individuals, a lot of them have been comfortable with this idea. However, some of them have not been capable of staking. And one of the reasons that they haven't been capable of staking is because any institution will normally have any amount of controls around its capital. So one of them might be ownership. And in simplistic terms, ownership is, you know, I need to be able to hold my own my own coin. So if we assume we're talking about Ether still and we look at uh, the currency, then we will see that someone needs to be able to prove they still hold it. Now, there are different levels of that. So early on, some people were saying, look, you know, if, if I can say it's non-custodial, I hold this withdrawal key or whatever it might be, that's enough to prove that actually it's still my funds, I haven't transferred it, I haven't swapped it for some other token, there's no disposal going mm -hmm. on. All of these things have come into play. A bit later on, though, and where we're starting to see perhaps a third wave come in now, are the institutions that still couldn't stake. And the reason they couldn't stake is they said, well, I'm telling my compliance officer that I'm taking these funds, I'm putting them into a system, and I really hope they'll come out one day. And that's an issue twofold. One, obviously, is risk. It's a seriously serious concern. However, completely separate to that, for a number of institutions, they said, well, that actually means I don't have control. If I do not have control of those funds anymore, I cannot keep them as, as my own funds on, on my balance sheet or whatever. As a result of that, there was a, a significant set of people who were like, look, I'd love to do this staking thing. I understand what it, what it is, what it does. I understand you know, why I'd want to do it. But actually, yeah. I'm just not possible to do it just now. And the idea is, is, is that obviously, as we're talking about, and as a, the theme of this conference is, now we're moving into a post-Shanghai world. We're in a world now where finally that, that loop closes and someone can say, yep, I can put funds in. They're still my funds. I haven't given them to anyone else. I still have full control and I can yeah. get them back when I need. And so that's been a, a huge thing. So generally speaking, when we talk to institutions, 
they normally understand staking. They normally understand it to the point of, yes, I understand, you know, I'm putting Ether down, I'm getting Ether back. Um, their issue has generally been around being able to have full control of that, either, you know, to their own satisfaction, to the satisfaction of their customers, to the satisfaction of their compliance officers. And that's something that certainly as we see Shanghai come online is something that we think is very, very exciting and will lead to this significant third wave of staking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those are all great points you raised. And we also have some great questions in the chat as well, which I want to get to. But I think let's talk for a moment. So from a financial perspective, I think everyone is fairly convinced that uh, staking is a, a great trade off, uh, just given you're not putting assets at risk. Um, you're really just participating, doing work in the network to earn additional token rewards in the, the form of more ETH. But let's talk some about some of the non-financial considerations. So you've touched on it a little bit um, throughout sort of your comments before, but some of the things we think about internally at CoinShares, there's obviously risk diversification becomes a big question. How do we diversify across service providers, different partners? Do we stake everything with one partner? Do we stake it ourselves? Do we run our own bare metal? A lot of questions there. Do we diversify across geography to contribute to the greater security the network and to diversify the actual physical infrastructure footprint that we're utilizing, relying on to support the Ethereum network? Um, how do we think about integration into our ERP reporting? How do we manage PL? Uh, we have a lot of questions now about compliance, particularly if we're also delivering MEV rewards. Do we want to use sanctioned MEV, like OFAC compliant MEV, non OFAC compliant MEV? I think a lot of questions and considerations. Maybe we can just go through and we'll go the other way this time. For each of you, just pick your top issue, maybe, out of all of those. The question that comes up the most when you talk to your clients about risk and addressing some potential risks or non-financial concerns when it comes to staking, and just give a brief insight uh, into what those those key questions are on the minds, particularly of the institutional clients who typically have more controls, Jim, as you alluded to, have internal requirements, internal mandates around risk exposure and how that risk exposure is managed and monitored. So Jim, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and, and start with you. Top issue, sure. non-financial risk perspective. So I'll cheat immediately and, and give you two because before people walk through the door, they're worried about risk. OK, they're concerned about risk. They're concerned about how the systems work, what they do and don't do. We've mentioned before that staking in Ether, for example, you know, it's, it's nominally risk free. That risk free means it's risk free in terms of the counterparty because the counterparty is the system itself. Um, yeah. But it's not risk free in terms of operation. So there are always concerns and, and, and worries about that. Um, but generally speaking, that's, that's the case of sitting down talking about architectures and other similar things that um, are fun and exciting, but probably will take a little bit longer to cover than we have here. Um, however, the important thing, the, the one that everyone actually cares about most is reporting. Um, so Malcolm, you mentioned it. Having very clear reporting, being able to separate consensus and execution rewards, being able to separate for institution into separate sub accounts, understanding the difference between what is counted as income and what is counted as capital movement. Again, this, and, and this is a huge one, by the way, the movement of ether from consensus to execution layer has to be very, very carefully tracked. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, again, you know, we have any number of jurisdictions out there, any number of different legal opinions on how staking rewards should be treated. It's an incredibly complex subject. And the short answer is, is, is that we don't have the answers. What we have to do is provide the tools where each individual yeah. institution can fit and work with its own structure as to how it believes each type of, of reward should be treated. You know, is a consensus reward immediate income? Is it wealth creation? Is it capital? What happens when that moves onto the execution chain? So all of these things are really, really tricky to nail down. And as we say, each, each you know, company, each jurisdiction has a different view on it. So the reporting side yeah. of things, being able to present all of this information broken down in the way that customers need, either native currency or in fiat, again, potentially different fiat currencies, Simple things like what's a day, obviously, you know, some people work in different time zones, we have some people that want to run in UTC, all of these things are in incredibly complex. So being able to provide a complete reporting framework is our customers number one requirement and something obviously that as a result of that, you know, we've done, we've done pretty well and, and worked on to ensure that we could provide them. So certainly I would say that that has to be the, the thing that has concerned our customers most and where we believe, you know, in terms of the value we present out um, beyond just running the thing, which 
as always for any financial system should be boring you know the only time anything is exciting is when something breaks so we don't like excitement but it's all focused on reporting and and that is absolutely i think the, the critical thing for everyone from high net worth individuals through institutions through through to solo stakers as someone who does her taxes every year uh, and has many Excel spreadsheets, I can confirm this is indeed the case. It is extremely challenging. And then I think furthermore, integrating that reporting into ERP solutions. I think Excel spreadsheets work to a certain scale, but after that they get very complex and cumbersome. I think actually some of this complexity is also why structured products and exchange traded products that just embed the staking component can sometimes be attractive, particularly if investors aren't necessarily looking to be fundamentally long an asset over a long period of time. They may not want the overhead of you know, building a really complex operational infrastructure. But I think once you've made the financial decision to participate in staking, then figuring out how to structure the technical operational footprint to support that activity can be a many months long process. So all great points, Jim. Uh, Michael, since Jim has taken two already off the table, you have to say something different. So biggest risk out of those that have not yet been mentioned, perhaps uh, compliance, perhaps um, uh, diversification, geographic concerns, hosting concerns when it comes to the actual technical architecture thoughts. Yes, uh, thanks. I fully agree with uh, Jim on the institutional side. So that's like one, one side of our customer base. But then we also got uh, a lot of OGs or long-term crypto holders that have been part uh, with the ICO we did for Ethereum back in the days. And, and there, their concerns are a bit different. They want to do what's right for the, for the network. They are long-term invested and they believe in the story. They believe from day one. So they, they still want to make sure that the network de develops in a healthy way. So to them, it's important uh, there's diversification, geography providers, uh, also even down to validation clients. And uh, especially in the conversation about all the risks arising from uh, the OFAC type of regulation, they have very strong views that there should be no censorship on the, on the base layer. Uh, so these are, these are almost like uh, two different sets of uh, client groups and requirements, and uh, it's quite hard to, to fit them into one product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the censorship concern in particular, I know, Marcus, you raised a KYC earlier, so I'm going to come back to you on KYC in a moment. But I think certainly, especially uh, with some of the interesting statistics emerging around which reference clients are used um, for different functions, particularly on the MEV side, and now also on the block building side, right? Because with proposer builder separation, I think we're going to see a whole new set of dynamics emerge there as well. Um, and obviously, there, there's one client client for each that is dominating over 50% of network activity. So some really important, I think, fundamental questions around, you know, how people are running these, these systems and what software and hardware they're relying on. Uh, Jerome, on your end, as you think about Coinbase staking solutions, what is the one top risk that's non-financial that your clients often ask about? Or what is something that internally you're really focused on optimizing for based on your experiences trying to articulate the benefits of staking um, and integrating staking into these institutional buyers? Yeah, the, the, the most important thing that you have mentioned before and has been an impediment in, in our discussions with clients has been the trade-off between liquidity and, and yield. Um, what I can say is we've had great discussions with clients uh, since around the merge. And on, on my side in EMEA and Asia Pacific, almost every client who had more than 32 ETH on their account, uh, I've been locking them and, 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 and I've been staking them. Um, now with what's happening with uh, the Shanghai fork, uh, with the emergence of uh, proper liquidity or well, liquid staking protocols, uh, I start to see some hedge funds, some ETP and ETF providers uh, asking more about uh, staking and be ready to offer staking solutions to their clients. I also start to see introducing brokers like all these fintech, payment rails companies and so on who are looking to offer staking to, to, to their clients thanks to that. Uh, so that was one, one big risk that, that is being removed. Uh, on the liquidity staking side, uh, there uh, is an issue that is a lack of liquidity uh, uh, staking standards. Uh, we've seen the emergence of like a lot of different uh, uh, tokens or, or representation tokens, and each is coming with like his uh, own set of, of liquidity, and that is not enough. Uh, as you know, in traditional finance, the more liquidity you have in the market, the more people are, are likely to come. So 
liquidity begets liquidity. Uh, and hopefully that is something that we're going to say, solve with the the, the liquid uh, staking collective, uh, which uh, Bitcoin Suite is also part of. Uh, talking more about technology, I think one of the important things that clients are asking for is uh, API first solutions uh, in order to be able to 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 have a, a frictionless integration uh, with the the various integrators. So I would I would leave it there. Yeah, I will say uh, if someone could offer like a great SDK or developer toolkit that allows for easy integration of staking, I think we'd definitely see more fintechs uh, trying to offer high yield savings, checking to clients, potentially integrating staking as an alternative. Although the treasury rate is looking pretty attractive these days. We'll see how long that lasts, but <laughs> definitely a lot of demand for yield in this, this current inflationary environment. All right, last but not least, Marcus, since you raised the issue of KYC before, please start by talking a little bit more about how you think about the KYC broader compliance issues um, when you talk to your clients about staking, and then uh, if there are any other risks that sort of come up from your, your view at Bridge Tower Capital, we'd love to hear those as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, uh, we mentioned the liquid staking solutions, right? There are multiples out there. And, um, you know, for everybody who is having enough 32 ETH and can directly stake, uh, they do not have the issue. But if you if you need to use a liquid staking solution like LIDAR, for example, um, then the counterparty risk is always a, a topic. So this is one of the number one concerns we hear from our clients counterpart risk. With whom do I more or less pool my money in these liquid staking pools? And uh, KYC, KYB is essential here. So you really want to know who is more or less my partner joining in uh, doing the staking operation to really reduce the counterpart risk. And I think as soon as this is gone and we are also working on the solution, we will see way more inflow from the institutionals because then they can be sure, yes, these are my partners. These are my validator nodes. Uh, potentially, we are OFAC compliant, right? Uh, and then you're more or less checking all the boxes. Yeah. Uh, no, I think this question of compliance will come up time and time again. And I think yeah. as Michael very well pointed out, I think there are certain clients who are going to be very pro-compliance and very stringent there. And there are others who are going to be very anti-censorship, particularly given the vision that these networks should be credibly neutral and non-political in nature. So I think there's sort of a fundamental existential question uh, for the crypto ecosystem there. And again, we see these tensions play out time and time again, uh, particularly when it comes to decentralization and censorship resistance. So that will be an important area to watch. Well, we're going to start to wrap things up, but I think there were two really exceptional questions that I saw in the chat. Um, so I just want to bring those up quickly. The first one was from Ben, and his question was, uh, you all rely on software developed for free by others to run your services. How are you supporting protocol devs and client dev teams? And I think this is a very important question. Um, obviously, the Ethereum Foundation has been instrumental from a research and development perspective, but there are many other organizations that are contributing to the development of a healthy and robust staking ecosystem. So at your organizations, how do you think about supporting these teams or participating in the broader ecosystem um, of open source software, policy, other sort of really important functions that are community goods in many ways? Are you funding them? Are you supporting them with, with research? Are you involved in any of these efforts? Open field, guys. Don't jump in all at once. <laughs> so maybe I really quickly start. Um, so we also have an ecosystem fund, right? So we are actively investing and supporting teams in, in multiple areas, including cybersecurity research, which we are currently supporting. I think this is super important. And, you know, in general, open source, open source tools and um, code is more or less at the heart of everything. And we're supporting that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what I can say at, at, at Coinbase, we're, we're spending a lot of time, energy, and, and money in, in supporting the entire infrastructure. And uh, you, you, you need more than the developer and the protocols like to make things, things work. And as we said, staking is about uh, uh, placing your, your tokens in order to, to secure the blockchain, which is what we're doing. And with the infrastructure, we're, we're helping that for that. Uh, the other thing that is very important, and that was the, the first time in a long time, uh, that I saw so much uh, good news around around Coinbase is when we launched the the base protocol. Um, we're big believers in EVMs, 
uh, we're uh, also trying to do everything we can to to support that that environment and ecosystem. Uh, just launching Base, which is a, a L2 using optimistic uh, um, technology. Um, it is completely open source. Uh, it is composable. Uh, it, it goes completely with the ethos of of crypto, and and we're hoping to bring like uh, millions of users to 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 to, to the ecosystem. Uh, if you look at the number of active user addresses on ETH at this point in time, or Ethereum at this point in time, I think it's like 500k. Uh, we have 110 million uh, KYC users at Coinbase. So just imagine we we bring 10% of, of these uh, to like EVM chains. Uh, it's going to make a massive difference. And I think like it's a good testament that we're trying to do everything to support that uh, ecosystem. Yeah, based super very exciting. And I think the more we can get users directly engaging with protocols. Um, more exciting it is. Yeah, we would say we also have some long-term contributions where it's not about the short-term business case, but the adoption. Um, the various products, we have a, a stable coin and the pay products, they're all long-term bets. And then maybe on the smaller side, we have a research fellowship grant. Uh, it went last year to Bitcoin developers. Um, it's a tiny piece compared to uh, the overall contribution of making crypto acceptable and the adoption happen. Uh, okay, so from a testament's point of view, we do various things. Uh, we do fund various companies out there. You'll often see our logo on a lot of the open source tools that are out there and available, providing monitoring information and similar. We are heavily involved with Ethereum specs, so we are involved with the actual specification process, um, things like withdrawals, for example, we, we were involved in the discussion in. We write our own open source software. Uh, at last count, something like 15 to 20% of the entire network runs software that, that we use. Uh, we also work with all of the individual client teams, so everything from, again, you know, specification of the clients to testing. Um, again, for Shanghai, we've run every single test net. We've worked with them to provide tools and support. So we are heavily embedded in the in the Ethereum ecosystem and definitely uh, are there to both help and support all of the various teams out there aiding client diversity as well as protocol development. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say for our Bitcoin shares, we fund Bitcoin core development via the MIT DCI. We have a team of independent researchers who publish research on a variety of topics, including Ethereum, Bitcoin, and many others. And I think um, for us, the, the other big contribution is teaming up with our partners in, in Europe and throughout Europe to push on the policy side as well. Policy advocacy is going to be really really important, a key component of that is not only education, but also gathering strong empirical evidence, gathering defensible research data. I think data in the crypto space is incredibly challenging, particularly when it comes to politically charged topics like staking, compliance, KYC, AML. And so trying to gather uh, as much impartial data as possible to present these issues in as non-political manner as possible is quite challenging. Uh, with that said, we're gonna wrap up here. Next, we're going to be hearing from Alison Mangero from the Proof of Stake Alliance. Uh, so she'll have much more to share on some of the questions we've seen in the chat around compliance, um, the SEC, their position on proof of stake tokens, and a lot of the other minutia and detail of regulation rulemaking that escapes my capacity. It's a very complex topic. So kudos to Allison for being willing to tackle it. Thank you, Marcus, Jerome, Michael, Jim. Uh, we did not have a chance to argue, but I look forward to arguing with all of you in person at some date in the future. Thank you for having right. us. Thank you very much. Mirko, back to you we go. Awesome. What a great panel. And uh, guys, make sure to check out Bridge Tower Capital, Coinbase, Bitcoin Swiss, Attestant, and CoinShares on Twitter um, and keep up um, with these uh, great updates. And now we have next Alison from the Proof of Stake Alliance. It's so great um, to have you with us. Um, thank you so much. Um, you're going to talk about staking regulation. Um, 
And it's amazing. Uh, it's a very hot topic right now. And uh, I think we can all thank you a lot for like spearheading all the efforts around like building a healthy regu regulatory treatment for staking in the US. So that's very much appreciated. And if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, and then, uh, yeah, please kick it off for the presentation. All right. Thanks, Mirko. So happy to be here today and um, pleasure to, to share what I can um, on staking regulation. So just to kick things off, um, as Mirko said, I'm Alison Mangero. I'm the executive director of an organization called the Proof of Stake Alliance uh, that we call POSA. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, POSA is an organization has existed since 2019. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization um, comprised of various players in the staking space and that make up proof of stake ecosystems. And our main goal is to advocate as best we can um, for clear and forward thinking public policies that foster innovation in these multi-billion proof of stake, uh, multi-billion dollar proof of stake ecosystems. Um, what we do, as I said, we advocate in favor of those policies that would help um, continue proof of stake ecosystems to grow. We educate legislators, regulators, and the public on these issues, um, mainly here in the US. And we aim to empower participants in these networks by hopefully amplifying their voices. So specifically in terms of the work that we've done, and I promise this is all going to lead into what you've been seeing in the past couple of months, um, no dearth of things to discuss there. Um, when we were founded, we really wanted to focus on developing industry principles for staking as a service providers. This was back in 2019. We sat down with SEC at that point in time, talked to them specifically about the principles that we were coming up with. We did a legal white paper with Paul Hastings and went through and said, okay, how should staking as a service providers be providing their technical services and the services that they are um, offering to various users? We publish those. We are also in the process of updating those to explain why uh, we think many of these staking arrangements do not constitute investment contracts, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we also collaborated with FinCEN and OFAC to facilitate the commercial development of staking as a service with the goal of basically ensuring that validators are not treated as financial entities. This again has become more relevant um, over the past year, thinking about the um, tornado cash sanctions, which we'll talk a little bit later. On the tax side, which I know the panel, uh, the previous panel talked about a little bit as well, we've been advocating for fair tax treatment of staking rewards, um, specifically arguing that they should be taxed at the time of disposition, not at the time of creation, and also have been doing some work um, uh, post-infrastructure bill to describe how uh, bad it would be if Section 6050I of the tax code were updated to place some really onerous reporting requirements on peer-to-peer -peer crypto transactions over $10,000. And most recently, we've published some legal white papers addressing um, liquid staking, both on the regulatory side and on the tax side, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, why do we at POSA think staking is important? I'm obviously preaching to the choir here, but staking isn't going anywhere. We think that these technologies will truly underpin um, the internet of value. Most blockchains either use or switching to using proof of stake. Obviously, we're all here because we've completed the merge. Um, Shanghai is a Coming, Ethereum is a very active proof of stake community. Um, and all almost all blockchain applications um, from financial infrastructure to NFTs are being built on these proof of stake protocols. So it's incredibly important that we get things right when it comes to regulation. And obviously, um, we've seen some bad ideas circulating in recent months. So 2023 is what many people are calling the year of regulation. I put a question mark there because I think it remains to be seen what, um, what actually happens in the coming months. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what we've seen so far, right? Um, so everyone's talking about recent enforcement actions, I think particularly when it comes to staking, talking about the Kraken settlement um, and what that means for staking as a service providers on the go forward. Uh, Gary Gensler has told folks to come in and register anyone who is engaged in staking as a service. We think there are some key distinctions to be made, which we'll talk about. Um, we've also seen some new proposed custody rules. Again, these are just proposed, but in February, the SEC um, basically proposed some changes to the existing custody rule under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, um, referred to as the safeguarding rule, which would basically require investment advisors to maintain client assets, specifically including crypto assets, um, in qualified custodial accounts. So what that would mean is a lot of these RAs who 
would under different circumstances stake with larger staking providers, now would have to do it under a new definition of qualified custodian. So again, this, this is just a proposal, but that could um, have some significant impacts. Mentioned this earlier about what we're seeing in terms of um, base layer neutrality and the industry advocating for base layer neutrality is that post tornado cash, cash sanctions, um, we think that there is, and um, I'm quoting Paradigm on this, who has an excellent paper on base layer neutrality, um, that they have the potential to be misinterpreted by base layer participants, which would include validators and other actors, such as builders, relay seekers, uh, searchers and sequencers, as requiring censorship of blocks involving sanctioned addresses. And we think that that could be incredibly problematic and folks are doing a lot of work to understand um, if those players are in fact exempted and we believe that they should be, so doing some work on that. And then in terms of POSA's work, but I think we're seeing this across the board, uh, a push toward industry principles and self-regulation. This is something that we've been focused on from the beginning and will continue to be focused on. So to talk a little bit about the crack and settlement and what that means on the go forward, um, I think it's very important to talk about definitions. And I like to say this is staking versus staking versus staking. We've heard the last panel talk about what exactly do you mean when you're using the term staking? So um, there's a recent blog post that Consensus put out, which basically just outlines, here are four ways to stake um, on Ethereum. And this is important just to, from a definitional perspective, although I'll try to do it quickly, um, because I think when we start, start analyzing these things, when it comes to the securities laws, this could potentially become important. Um, so solo staking, I think we're most familiar with, what some call protocol staking, a user deposits 30 to ETH into the official um, deposit smart contract runs the Ethereum software and receives rewards directly from the protocol for staking. Um, then you have custodial staking, where users enter into an agreement with a service provider for it to stake ETH using that provider's infrastructure. Here, the user generally is granting the provider custody of the ETH to be staked, and that can um, let's just say become complicated in many jurisdictions because there are regulatory implications there. Third, we have delegated self-custodial software as a service staking. Try to say that three times fast. Um, this is, I think, what most of us or many of us traditionally would think of as, um, you know, software as a service. Here, and again, this is very important once we get into the securities law analysis, the user is not granting the provider custody of the ETH to be staked. Um, and so that arrangement allows the user to develop from using this professional software development uh, developer software, but they maintain control and ownership. They never relinquish um, the custody of those tokens. And that's incredibly important. And now we're seeing smart contract facilitated liquid staking, uh, which we'll talk a lot about. And here users are depositing any amount of ETH into a smart contract, which when it receives 32 ETH total, um, will spin up a validator um, provided by one of many validator operators. Why did I bother with that? Um, there's a block of text on the screen, but to give you the TLDR, whether you are validating on your own, you are paying a third party, including a smart contract protocol to help you stake or otherwise, the economic relationship between service providers and service users are not new. They are not novel and they almost never implicate the investor protector, the protection laws. These rewards and fees are not, and I heard Melton say this in the previous panel, yield on a loan. They are not a dividend on investment. Staking is important because you ha we have to maintain and secure the network. It is important and these blockchain networks require them to function. This is not an investment scheme. So any service agreements that are offering technical staking solution, and I'm fond of saying Validators provide technical services, not financial services. These should not be viewed as investment contracts or any other type of enumerated security. Um, similarly, we've seen Coinbase post crack and settlement come out and explain again that staking should not be viewed as a security under, under the US Securities Act, nor under the Howey test. And trying to basically superimpose these laws on a process like staking doesn't actually help consumers at all. Again, this is all supposed to be about consumer protection. And so we, I think, need to do a better job of describing what staking actually is and how it differs from something like lending. 
um, if we are to get this right. So we at POSA, I mentioned this earlier, came up with staking as a service industry principles in 2019. You can see them here on the screen. I think they remain true today, although we are convening a working group to update them. Um, we should be using non-financial terminology when it comes to staking. Again, when you guys are thinking about particular offerings, I think this becomes incredibly important. We should be consistently focusing on security and participation of the network. Again, that's why staking is important. We're providing access to the protocol for various users. And we should not be providing guarantees on the amount of rewards earned. I think in particular, even in the Kraken complaint, you do see a distinction between direct protocol staking and some things that various um, providers will do to inflate yield or provide users with with rewards above and beyond the rewards that are being offered by the protocol. That's, I think, when regulators look at this and say things are getting a little bit dicey here and this looks more like a lending product than something else. Um, so liquid staking, as I mentioned, and I will go through this kind of quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions. We recently brought together a working group of many um, folks in the liquid staking space, along with many legal experts to basically uh, provide an open source to the community to white papers um, about how we should think about liquid staking under US law. One that is focusing on the nature of receipt tokens um, and looking at LSTs under the um, commodities laws and the securities laws. And then also looking at the conversion of the underlying token to receipt token and whether that should be viewed as a taxable event. I have the, the summary of this up on the screen, but basically the work of the of the group found that these LSTs for digital commodities, so important here, the underlying token has to be viewed as a digital commodity. And I know there's still a lot of back and forth where we're seeing SEC say pretty much everything except Bitcoin should be viewed as a security when we're talking about these underlying tokens. You've had CFTC and others in Congress um, suggest that ETH, as it kind of historically has been looked at, should be viewed as a digital commodity. Again, until legislation is passed and there's kind of very clear uh, take on that, but I think we'll continue to see this turf war between the SEC and the CFTC. But again, when we're talking about liquid staking, provided the underlying token is viewed as a digital commodity, um, the receipt tokens or the liquid staking tokens for those digital commodities should not be considered investment contract or notes or treated under under securities under the US federal securities laws. They should not be considered swaps under a commodity law. And the, the conversion of those crypto assets for seed tokens should not be considered taxable events. Most importantly, um, we should be accurately and appropriately describing these liquid staking receipt tokens as liquid staking tokens or LSTs instead of the inaccurate but very commonly used term. Uh, I think that we've all seen on crypto Twitter, liquid staking derivatives or LSDs. I think it is common sense to not call something that is not a derivative a derivative. Um, similar to what we've seen with yield, I think it will become very confusing when it comes to regulation and also compliance. The reason for this analysis is basically just as you have a warehouse receipt or bills of lading, other documents of title that basically allow people to transfer ownership of physical commodities when they're in storage and transport, these liquid staking to tokens enable people who are using proof of stake networks to transfer ownership of digital commodities without unstaking them. And again, we want these to remain staked because that's important for the security and maintenance of the network. So we're just basically arguing that receipts for digital commodities should be treated just like receipts for physical commodities, that there should not be disparate treatment just because one um, is digital and the other is physical. We're saying, let's just take the laws as they already exist and apply them appropriately to this novel technology. Um, we've also come up with some liquid staking principles which basically say that we should be using appropriate terminology to describe the tokens. Again, getting back to LSTs versus LSDs. Focus on increasing liquidity, which I think is very important, especially in the current environment, um, without sacrificing what's of utmost importance, allowing these things to continue to be staked for security and network participation. And then developing tools that enable direct staking with access to liquidity, not staking back to yield products. Again, where we're seeing red flags and regulators start to get involved is when there is some kind of yield that is offered on top of what would be directly offered by the network. I think there need, there will have to be a lot more explaining done um, when 
products look like that. Um, and then, of course, there is a fourth one, which is, as always, refrain from providing investment advice. Um, never a good idea. So what's next? I think given what's going on in the macro environment, and this should come to a surprise to to, to no one here, um, we may see a banking package introduced um, in the coming weeks or months, potential for stable coins to be added there, some, some things on custody potentially, I don't think we'll see anything on staking there. Um, will there be additional enforcement actions? Probably. Um, what those will look like and what shape they will take remains to be seen in the coming months. I don't think we'll see much. I think there will be bills introduced in Congress. I think the likelihood of them being passed is not likely in the coming months, um, but there will be some action, I think, from people trying to introduce some things that are sensible. Uh, we do know that regulators are obviously still looking close, closely at custodial staking arrangements. Um, and so that's something that we will obviously continue to see. So with that, um, happy to take questions now, also knowing that I talked for a really long time uh, and a plug for a panel later, we'll also be talking on making staking compliance. So happy to do that at that point in time as well. And please do feel free to reach out to me, though I cannot provide you legal or investment advice. I can try to explain what's going on. Awesome. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, maybe just to like wrap up uh, before we head into the next panel, could you just like summarize what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, for the regulatory treatment for staking at this moment? And what's a very practical thing that everyone watching today can do to also support your efforts and support the healthy regulatory treatment for staking? So I'm very fond of saying, let's start doing ourselves some favors. Um, I think Coinbase has done some excellent work um, leading up to the announcement of the Kraken settlement and post Kraken settlement, which by the way, I'll just say Kraken settled. So that's not precedential um, in terms of what came out at that point in time, but it's something I know we're all watching. Um, I think we should very, we should try to very accurately describe what's going on when we talk about staking. We should try to distinguish staking from lending, distinguish, as I said, liquid staking tokens from derivatives. We should be very careful about the words that we use, the way that we're describing the activities that we engage in, and also explain why it's incredibly important for the functioning of these networks. So if we all in industry could do a better job of that, it makes it a lot easier when you go and sit down with a regulator or a lawmaker um, and explain what's going on here and why things should be treated in a particular way. So that would be my uh, my clarion call to, to the industry. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's that's great practical advice. Just call it for what it is. Um, I think that's all what, what we can really apply in our communications, uh, especially building the protocols, building the liquid staking solutions, and also for the investors who are interacting with it. Um, so thank you so much, Alison. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, stay tuned for Alison to join later for the uh, staking compliance panel as well. And now we will continue with the liquid staking panel, um, talking about the current and future landscape of Ethereum liquid staking and um, the benefits, risk, and opportunities of liquid staking for the DeFi space. So I'm super excited to welcome on stage um, the moderator, Jordan from Stakewise. Um, great to have you on board. And joined by Konstantin from Lido, uh, one of the OGs in this space. Um, same uh, as Darren from Rocket Pool. Um, Mike from Etherfy, um, uh, hot new liquid staking protocol, and uh, Mohawk from Klasek, uh, leading liquid staking on Polygon, and uh, Mara, who's spearheading efforts for industry-wide liquid staking standards with Alluvia. Um, please kick it off, Jordan. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the intro, and um, obviously, thanks for all the panelists for joining. We've got a pretty stacked panel today. Um, and so obviously, yeah, first off, welcome. This panel will be based on uh, liquid staking specifically. Um, liquid staking is certainly a hot topic. It's one of the key themes in the whole DeFi ecosystem right now. Um, I spend all day, every day talking about liquid staking, and um, you can never underestimate the amount of people who actually don't understand specifically what you mean when you say liquid staking. Everybody understands staking, but the, the liquid aspect is often lost. So I think the good place to start um, would be just to define what liquid staking is and maybe Constantine, you can kick us off here. So like, what is liquid staking and why, and what's some of the benefits people, people can expect to receive? Yeah. Hi everyone. Really excited to be here. First of all, you know, like, uh, when we speak about liquid staking, uh, usually, you know, like people has an issue, you know, like when they stake, 
the tokens are liquid. Why? Because proof of stake is work like that. When you stake, you hold the risk and you get reward for this risk. And if risk happened, then you slashed and you lose part of your rewards. And if you're like doing everything well, then you get uh, some rewards. Yes. And, uh, and, and because, you know, like this slashing uh, can happen not, uh, uh, it not can ha happen in a moment, it can happen like in a week. So you need to freeze your assets for some time and uh, guarantee that uh, you did your job well. And uh, for that, you know, like, but a lot of people want to use uh, these uh, assets that's already staked and get this risk as a collateral in different, for example, DeFi protocols or CFI protocols and uh, uh, get even more yield, for example, or get some assets or not yield, but rewards, yes, and get uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and they want to reuse these assets or they want to transact in it. And that's where liquid staking work. First of all, you know, liquid staking is a middleware, you know, like it's smart contracts uh, that work in some logic, you know, like it's they regulated by technology and what they provide you to stake uh, through them and uh, distribute your stake to many validators. They give you liquidity. They give you, sometimes they, you can sell your stake this by the same price. And so, so you can unstake, especially it's important until withdrawals are unavailable. And also you get some other features like using uh, the stake this in collateral. So in general, it's a simple product uh, that, and especially uh, important is based on smart contracts in technology regulated uh, that anyone can use to stake and keep blockchains decentralized and hope censorship resistant. Awesome. Yeah, I think, um, so just to kind of recap, the, the two main benefits are the ability to almost unstake on demand to, to kind of not, to bypass the native and bonding periods that are, that are seen on the different proof of stake networks, um, and also the ability to utilize your state capital in DeFi. And um, maybe, uh, Darren, you want to kick us off as well, to, like, what is liquid staking in the context of this Shanghai upgrade? I'm conscious Shanghai has probably been mentioned before, but there's no harm in giving a quick update on what is Shanghai and what it means for Ethereum and what it means for liquid staking as well. Yeah, hey, thanks everybody. So um, Shanghai is the culmination of uh, obviously many years work. Uh, the the merge that happened in September was kind of the move from proof of work to proof of stake. And so the Shanghai is the last piece of the puzzle. It is uh, implementing withdrawals so that those people who are um, participating in securing Ethereum by staking their ETH can actually unstake uh, whenever they want. So um, that's a that's a big deal. Well, actually, there's two elements to it. First one is that they can access their rewards on like a almost real time basis, um, uh, which is which is important because then you know they're actually accessing those rewards. Uh, and the second thing is they could withdraw. They can withdraw. So um, yeah, so that that's that's kind of uh, that's Shanghai. Um, yeah. And like in the context of liquid staking, so like I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people think that um, you know when when you can withdraw natively from the from the, the network, like liquid staking suddenly becomes you know, less less attractive. And I think mm. the argument there is, it's still very much you know there's still going to be unbonding periods. Uh, you know you're still going to need um, uh, instant unstaking and the ability to unstake uh, and, and actually sorry the ability to utilize your stake capital is, is still something that is is, is super valuable. Um, so. What about on the institutional side? Like, so, so Mara, how are you seeing um, the demand for for institutional staking, uh, for specifically in the, in the liquid staking side? Uh, one thing, sorry, Jordan, I uh, just wanted to add one more point uh, on the the impact of Shanghai, uh, primarily on liquid staking. Uh, so, the one one great impact after Shanghai would be like uh, till now, especially for Ethereum liquid staking, the biggest challenge for liquid staking has been de-pegging risk uh, of the uh, of the received value issue. Uh, after withdrawal, the depegging risk becomes lower and lower. And the second impact is, uh, till now, the it was uh, a bit easier to 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 maintain the dominance uh, in terms of like the liquid staking protocols that started early uh, or who were able to maintain that dominance uh, and keep kind of doing it because it was one side stake. That once you stake, there was no exit. Uh, and after Shanghai, I believe there'll be like massive rift towards people like moving their stake around. 
uh, different liquid staking protocols or like just vanilla staking or different staking pools yeah completely i completely agree i appreciate you jumping in there um uh yeah so sorry back to the original question so then so then mara how are you seeing um like the, the what, what are, what's the institutional appetite for liquid staking you're seeing on your side yeah, so I've worked in the staking space for a couple of years now, you know, supporting the rollout of staking products, staking as a service products across, you know, custodial venues, exchanges, you know, um, and across other enterprises and counterparties. What's been really interesting is that we've seen the uptick of staking in the institutional market generally, I think over the last 18 months, as more institutions are looking for participation that secures, you know, the inflationary aspect of their asset holdings, but also looking to create utilization um, on tokens that they hold on their balance sheet. One of the really interesting things, and this actually ties in with what we're observing with the Shanghai fork, is that institutions have sort of sat on the sidelines, um, given some of the you know financial and te technological risk that has been associated uh, with unknown withdrawal periods, right? For institutions, that has been a major, major blocker in you know, truly adopting traditional staking products um, that have been available in the market today. And that's one of the you know, values that liquid staking solutions actually unlock. I think as we see you know, the post-Shanghai world, there's one of these very, very large milestones that significantly shift, I think, the perception of participation risk in the institutional market. I think it's probably going to be one of the fastest accelerators that we will see in the uptake of institutional demand. Now, as we have all these people on the panel today, you know, products are being designed that actually meet the needs of that customer segment. And that's one of the things that, you know, at Liquid Collective, we have focused on um, with regards to the efforts of the protocol design and feature capabilities that we've accounted for to really prepare, you know, for this momentum and adoption lever that we're going to see um, post Shanghai, Shanghai upgrade. Um, I think one of the other pieces that I would just call out is as the institutional market, you know, comes online or on chain, right, and considers participating in the market, one of the frames that I've used to consider this is they'll they'll choose the best products, right? And when you look at traditional staking solutions, right, usually single operator architectures create some sort of centralization risk that actually liquid staking protocols mitigate against beyond providing liquidity and optionality to move assets around. Liquid staking protocols actually also offer diversification of the operator set that creates significant improvements um, to protect from correlated failures. The ability you know, to meet the needs of institutions where they're at, for example, through alluvial integrations that are supported in custodial venues like Coinbase Prime um, or Bitcoin Swiss. And then, of course, the liquidity aspect that will continue to be extremely important for institutions looking to build products and solutions like ETFs or ETPs um, that are looking at liquidity aspect as a considerable design parameter in their participation. Got it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think um, you know what we've suddenly seen is the demand is suddenly there for, for staking, and we've seen a lot of commercial net operators and custodians who are looking to join you know our protocol to actually leverage liquid staking. There, there's actually like a bit of a mixed um, mixed response on the the liquid aspect from the institutional side, but I think the narrative is that. The reason why these custodians are, uh, and node operators are getting involved is because they know the institutions will want to do it. They just don't quite know yet uh, that, that, that they want to do it. So uh, they're very much getting ready to prepare for the influx of, of state capitals and specifically uh, liquid staking. So Mara, so Mara mentioned the ability to, to obviously unstake being a key blocker and the fact that there are certain protocols designed towards institutions. So Mike, maybe you want to have a do a deeper dive into some of the key pain points that institutions have with um, some of the existing liquid staking protocols and how you can design a protocol to satisfy the, the institutional needs. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, we're uh, of course kind of one of the one of the newcomers in this space, so we we uh, uh, are uh, approaching it from kind of a, a uh, first principles from the ground up uh, kind of perspective. And we also come at it from having uh, been an institutional ETH investor ourselves. Like we, we operate uh, a hedge fund um, that uh, stakes ETH and have evaluated a lot of the different solutions that are out there. And so we've heard a lot of uh, the concerns and questions that institutional investors uh, uh, tend to raise in this, uh, in this category. Uh, 
And there's a number of things that uh, tend to come up uh, over and over again. Uh, one of the big ones that we've heard uh, and we, you know, we had ourselves as, as uh, uh, with our fund um, uh, was uh, questions around custody. Um, there's, uh, you know, custody in particular with ETH staking is not as simple as uh, uh, custody when it comes to uh, other proof of stake uh, protocols, um, which have more kind of native uh, and, and more straightforward uh, staking and unstaking mechanisms. Um, whereas Ethereum has a lot more complexity in terms of key management and basically two you know, separate chains like the execution layer and the beacon chain, which kind of have a complex uh, interrelationship. So questions of custody are, are, are a big one. Um, we had a lot of institutional investors that um, um, you know, were not able to participate in liquid staking because their auditor or their compliance officer uh, would not be able to basically uh, sign off on uh, the, the, them actually retaining custody after they swap into a, a kind of a receipt token. So that's a, that's a big factor we, we heard over and over again. Uh, and then another uh, uh, item that uh, we heard a number of times is uh, with respect to reporting. Um, and this was actually mentioned in the previous uh, panel that um, when you stake you, your sources of rewards, I mean, there's half a dozen different uh, areas that uh, you're actually earning uh, staking rewards from. And if you can't sort of itemize them and put a timestamp on each one, these things uh, introduce uh, a lot of risk. So I think as protocols, as folks, you know, all operating in this in this space, it's important for us to uh, be mindful of these things and to offer kind of a, a package solution, whether it's ourselves or with, uh, with partnerships uh, uh, to institutional investors so that they can answer the custody questions and not uh, get in trouble with their compliance officer uh, and uh, to get the reporting that they need in order to uh, you know, appropriately remit taxes depending on kind of the jurisdiction that they're, uh, they're in. And that's obviously, you know, for us, that's both of these are like front and center. Awesome. I hear you. So I've got some horses going past my, my window. Um, pros of working from home. Um, no, I hear you. And what about like um, like cap capital pooling? Maybe Mara, this could be something that could, given your solution is, you know, a permission staking pool and maybe how that differs constantly. And obviously, please jump in afterwards regarding, you know, how, how Lido works. Like, How do you see like capital pooling being um, a focus point for institutions as well? Oh, sorry, I thought like you said Mara. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I did say Mara, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that um, felt really important to us in the really early, you know, design phases of the protocol was figuring out how we could optimize for the things that institutions care about, which is effectively high liquidity, market depth, having accessibility across different venues in a way that more closely resembles traditional financial markets. When we looked at the landscape in the existing market, it felt like there was a lot of fragmentation happening um, that we were, you know, that we were trying to actively design against. So we had, you know, a very active market of sort of crypto native liquid staking products and solutions and centralized exchanges and custodians building their own solutions in sort of a siloed, fragmented manner. We felt that there could be a better way to build that. And one of the reasons why Liquid Collective is composed of so many different you know, institutions and enterprises supporting it is because we felt like building a standard could actually be a really, really great way to prepare for the liquidity and you know, market depth demand that we would expect from a maturing you know, market on the institutional side. Um, in terms of how we, you know, manage that today, we we're taking the approach of ensuring that we one, you know, meet institutions where they're at today, prioritizing support, liquidity, and market depth um, on, you know, centralized exchanges. But we've also focused on ensuring that there's accessibility that provides, you know, not just access but also utility capture moving into the decentralized financial market, right? And the DEXs and the DeFi protocols that exist there are going to be a fundamental part of our go-to-market. Yeah, right. I, can, I can add here, you know, like, first of all, we should think, you know, like, what institutional client are, you know, should care about. In general, you know, like, they, uh, if they have some ease already, and staking, they want to have some rewards and contribute to security of the of the network. And what is important is that they have some value, you know, like and this value depends on Ethereum success. 
And Ethereum success is depends of two features, you know, like and many others, yes, but the main important is decentralization and censorship resistant. And we need to teach them, you know, like if they staking with some huge one validator like entities, exchanges, you know, like they just, or, you know, like, because, you know, like if you will move uh, decentralization and censorship resistant from Ethereum, Ethereum will be just a database or like state machine or DLT, and it will not have value at all. And to keep these values of Ethereum, first of all, what institutional clients should think that they contribute to censorship uh, resistant and decentralization. When you speak about uh, like uh, different aspects, uh, you know, like it's really a lot of institutional are already staking, for example, with LIDA, for example, Anderson Horowitz staking with LIDA and many others. And the question is, they try to find a, like legal opinion and understand how liquid staking is working in like a country where they based because depends on the location <laughs> there how to say uh, the logic is pretty different if you look for example on maker maker has some pool liquidity and they what they did through bank signal they bought treasuries it means that they found a way how to work with that liquidity in a fully compliant way. And what I try to say is that, I mean, institutional already use it, then it's definitely, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, a way how to use liquid staking and, uh, they, and their compliance team are happy uh, with what products we have right now. Got it. No, that's interesting. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing on our side is, you know, the, one of the key blockers is that capital pooling. Like as much as we want to encourage decentralization, et cetera, like institutions pooling capital with anonymous users or even other institutions in other jurisdictions is, is, is can be problematic. And so one of the things we're doing on our side is re removing the ability, the need to capital pool altogether. So um, it's interesting how people are, are tackling this, um, you know, the, the institutional market in different ways. Like centralization has been touched upon a couple of times now already. So, Let's throw it over to you, Darren. I think one of the things, and like ultimately one of my concerns with bringing a lot of institutional capital into the ecosystem is that if they have to stake with only a small number of, of like commercial node operators, they can have, you know, whilst institutional coming in, institutional capital entering this ecosystem is, is super important, it can also be a very centralizing effect. Uh, and so it kind of interested to hear your ideas on um, how you can maybe, how, how we can maybe approach that. And obviously Rocket Pool, being completely permissionless node operators, do you see a, a, a future where uh, institutions actually end up staking with, you know, home stakers, solo stakers? I hope so, <laughs> because uh, so with okay, so decentralization from a uh, institutional perspective um, should be seen as a risk mitigation strategy. That is that is what decentralization is on on multiple levels. Uh, so it, not only does it align with, you know, the ethos of Ethereum it, it, for good reason. Um, and so th that's certainly a way that institutions should be looking at decentralization is as a risk mitigation strategy. Um, I think what's important is, I think you certainly will get a balance between the two. You'll get um, institutions that um, have to know the providers that they're, um, they're staking with. Um, in which case, you know, that has to go on nodes that a, a select provider is providing them. Um, I, I kind of hope that uh, institutions can work with decentralized protocols to enable the long tail, um, because the long tail of node operators is where we get the most, is the, uh, Ethereum gets the most value, and where we get the kind of the better risk benefits uh, for institutions as well. If I can jump in and add a little bit to that, I think, um, and I hope everyone will agree with me here that my hope uh, post Shanghai uh, and beyond is that there are going to be multiple flavors of uh, staking that uh, end up thriving and end up um, serving users across different jurisdictions. Like to build on what a uh, number of points that other folks have made, I think Constantine was, was talking about uh, different, you know, uh, folks uh, staking in different uh, uh, protocols based on what is allowed in their jurisdiction. 
I think that is hopefully going to lead to kind of a multitude of, of players operating in this uh, in this space, rather than a concentration in sort of one one or two different uh, models. So I think there, there, you know, maybe in the U.S., uh, you're going to have uh, you know a category where like the, the more permissioned, uh, you know, whitelisted uh, type of approach is maybe what starts to to thrive. Whereas in other jurisdictions, you're going to have more uh, permissionless. Uh, kind of uh, solo staking type uh, operations that uh, become dominant, which I think would be good for, uh, uh, you know, for Ethereum and broadly. So, so I think it's, a, it's just important to acknowledge that there, there's not a one size fits all solution that's, uh, that's going to dominate the category. Yeah. Also to hop like off that, Mike, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we're going to see over time, hopefully an evolution in the needs that institutional customers and enterprises have the topic of validator diversification or even knowing where validators are operating and who the counterparties are to effectively assess counterparty risks is one of the things that we have found to be, you know, a particularly important consideration for some, you know, sophisticated or more traditional financial institutions that are looking to enter the market. I think as, you know, stewards of decentralization and security, you know, protocols that are supporting these services have a responsibility to help the market move in a direction where we continue optimizing for validator decentralization using, you know, robust standards for performance, security and things that matter to institutional clients as we, you know, look at continuing to diversifying um, the, off, you know, active set across different solutions. So I definitely view that as our responsibility as well. We are investing really heavily in figuring out how we move across um, the path and the roadmap um, to opening up, you know, participation in an active set that can, you know, comply with security and performance standards that institutions have, uh, but continue opening up, you know, participation across other market participants. Yeah, no, I completely agree with all the points made. And I think it's a, and what's also on us is, is an education. Like we need to, we need to educate the institutions that we, we don't bang on about decentralization for no reason. There's a very much a security issue there that we're, we're all trying to strive for. Um, let's, let's swing back towards um, like more of the liquid staking topic here. So we mentioned one of the benefits of liquid staking is the ability to use your, your state capital in DeFi. So maybe Mohak, how do you see um, the institutional demand for DeFi and how do you see the, the DeFi landscape um, for institutions? So for example, um, Aave, obviously the, the, the most famous money market that currently exists in DeFi has created a separate protocol called Aave Arc that is specifically designed, that is permissioned and specifically for institutional capital. How do you see uh, institutions effectively adopting either the current permissionless DeFi or new protocols like Aave Arc and how, the, the allocation of capital between the two? Okay, uh, so I think like one is uh, in the current shape of whether it's liquid staking or DeFi, uh, like in order to kind of, let's say, use liquid staking in DeFi, the first problem still remains like how to acquire that liquid staked asset. Uh, and for any institution, like there are multiple risks. Uh, for example, if you talk um, like before moving to DeFi, like on liquid staking side, the, one of the risks is, uh, I mean, uh, one of the risks is uh, slashing risk that if the value gets slashed, then you lose a lot of your principal itself. Then the second is the price risk. Uh, imagine the underlying asset itself goes down by 40%. You just lost like 10 years yield. Uh, and the third is um, obviously smart contract risk. Uh, if there's any bug in the smart contract itself, then uh, like uh, the losses can be incurred. And when you're talking about institutions, uh, I would say like primarily, let's say think about like endowments, pension funds, who, uh, who are not looking for like crazy yield, uh, like DeFi degens. Uh, they are looking for stable, uh, but long-term yields. So if we are able to overcome all these three risks, then they're able to kind of enter liquid staking. Now moving, using these assets in DeFi, now again, like some of the assets, some of the problems remains the same, the smart contract, uh, smart contract risk. And uh, one of the important points that Mara uh, raised was uh, uncertainty. I think the one thing that any institution hates the most is the uncertainty. Even if let's say the withdrawal period or anything was like three years, okay, that's predictable. Anything like unpredictable, it goes like haywire. Um, so. I mean, to overcome that, one of the products that we are building uh, is called Son Sonic, uh, which is uh, which is which which can be used for across any liquid state asset, whether it's Rocket Pool, whether it's Lido, whether it's uh, Clay Stack, uh, whether it's Stakewise. Uh, even for example, after the 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 unstaking, uh, there will still be a withdrawal queue, uh, which can again risk uh, or give you deep again risk. So uh, that can solve uh, all of that. And now using for deep, uh, having sep separate versions. Uh, for institutions, 
to to be honest uh, I, i'm not like a very strong believer in that uh, because one of the most important thing that defi offers is composability uh, and the moment uh, like we all we are already seeing liquidity so fragmented across defi uh, it's so hard to to build liquidity pools uh, without liquidity mining incentives uh, and the more we fragment the liquidity uh, the lesser it would be uh, so uh, i i don't see like how how uh how do you build uh specific version for different institutions and still have all that composability and liquidity yeah no completely agree i think the fragmentation is certainly something that would that would certainly limit limit adoption in, in both uh, both the spheres it's funny you mentioned um your new product i'm kind of keen to talk to you about that because you mentioned the depegging of lsds like you know shanghai brings the ability to remove the the risk of you know, the one of the key risks of depegging but my one of my big concerns is that people th- suddenly think that these assets are never going to depeg and yeah. you know there is still very much a risk that you know in black swan events and uh, situations where there's a lot of capital wanting to unstake like depegging is almost certain to guarantee like to happen um but they they they're going to be more short lived so i'm kind of interested to hear more but we can obviously catch up about that uh, offline of course you mentioned you mentioned risks so let's let's we've mentioned a lot of benefits so far let's kind of touch upon some of the risks so um You mentioned smart contract risk. Uh one of the things actually Constantine kind of in keen to hear your opinion on is how institutions view the protocols or the the governance of liquid staking protocols. So stakewise, Lido, we're DAOs. How how have you seen uh institutional uh, appetite to actually working with a protocol and um staking with a protocol that's governed by a DAO, an entity which is ultimately very new to to the to the space. Uh that was a question for me? Yes, it was indeed. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And uh you know like uh, first of all, yeah, as you said, it is a lot of different risk and uh, when you speak about liquid staking, you should speak about risks too. One of them is smart contracts, another is flashing. Of course, it is uh, you know like you, it is uh, sometimes it's your benefit and sometimes it's uh, like it's not uh, your benefit. For example, if you have like 100 validators as that run are under uh, under that middleware then your risk is even i think smaller than you stake with some large one or, or node validator uh, when you came to governance or uh, governance risk it is a risk definitely you know like in each protocol it is different uh, risk and in different way how it's mitigated uh for example as i know for lider lider uh, it is a proposal from one of the core developer who is working uh, and contributing to lider dao uh, and it's called dual governance uh, and uh, in general i think this is a big thing you know like especially you know like what what we feel right now you know like that usd is not so stable you know like every year we lose now about 6% because of the inflation but but why it's happened when you look back you know like uh in 90 like 46 they said to european people that let's bake usd dollar by gold and move all the gold to us you know like and that was a clear proposition they said like a lot of liquid staking assets or protocols now say guys we will help you with staking you know like of your assets and there are a lot of countries move their assets to us and then in 1970 uh, i don't remember the clear year but nixon came to the public and said that now usd dollar is not backed anymore by gold and usd dollars couldn't vote on it you know like they couldn't block it you don't have how to say like regulation about that it was that decision because of the high inflation in one country a lot of people were wrecked in some way and now we have the same story here but what blockchain give you what smart contracts give you they give you technology regulation you can regulate on smart contracts level where staked is holders can vote and block upgrade of governance smart contracts and lido proposes new feature called dual governance i think it will be a standard for a lot of different products where if for example one if in 1970s 70s us had this blockchain technology and smart contract and usd dollar were implemented there and they would get and they would have a you know like a dual governance usd dollar holders would never they would block this proposal to unbake usd dollar from a gold 
And the same is here. Dual governance risk can be mitigated by delegating the veto power to stake these users. For example, yes, yeah, stake these users. Can I can I add one more one thought on the yeah. uh, on the extreme dark side of this? Uh, yeah. Is like um, uh, what Constantine uh, mentioned that uh, like once once uh, like code is the law. Uh, in short, that once it's there, it's going to happen. Uh, whereas I, I feel like, for example, let's say you are a power user of anything, let's say McDonald's, uh, and you got a pass from McDonald's that now lifetime, you can have free burgers uh, for next 100 years. Now, if it's issued by McDonald's, you believe in that, that it's going to happen for the next 100 years, uh, and no executive is going to come and block it. Versus here, uh, a lot of times it has happened in the past, and it will keep happening that DAOs can make a lot of empty promises or infinite amount of empty promises because they know that the DAOs or the later on it can be blocked. For example, like any investor who has, uh, let's say, invested early in the DAO or let's say some super user who got ability to not pay fee for the next um, like lifetime or whatever. And then the DAO passes a vote later. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, this was done like previously. We don't see that value anymore. Uh, let me like block all of that. Let me remove, uh, remove you uh, as, as a super user. You don't get any benefits. Uh, you invested early. Now uh, you did not add enough value. Now we're like forfeiting your contract, which is not that common uh, in centralized entities. So how, how do we like overcome that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, like you have, uh, I, I'm not agree with you. First of all, in centralized entities, you have every day like that, you know, like that a lot of people are committing a lot of things that is not auditable and transparent. And that is a solution on blockchain. And there, are, of course, you know, like you have how to say in case of Lydon for now, they didn't implement it yet because it is a pipeline of what they need to deliver. But it is a research about that. It is a solution. It is a governing risk, you know, like, but uh, I mean, this is a solution that can improve all liquid staking protocols if they will use our dual governance. I, I think so. The use of institutional stake. Uh, in protocols that have um, DAOs um, will probably be the prominent situation. Um, DAOs decentralize governance. That's the whole point of a DAO. Otherwise, you'd have a company. Um, and it, what that means is that they're not at the will of any one entity. They don't have to trust another entity. This is that whole kind of blockchain future um, that everyone keeps talking about. So uh, not only that, but DAOs are kind of a, a form of participatory governance. Uh, and so it means that they are kind of aligned with those, uh, with the people who are actually using and take value from the protocol. So, you know, that they, they're kind of key elements that I think uh, institutions um, should be kind of aware of. That said, I, I do think that we will kind of move to a minimal governance um, uh, kind of situation um, you know, as, as, we, as we go on into the future and um, so that we can kind of minimize that, that footprint for governance risk. Awesome. Thanks, guys. It was great to see you. Uh, let, let, letting you de debate it amongst yourselves. That's, that's, that's great. We've conscious we're quickly running out of time. Um, there is one uh, quick question I wanted to ask from the audience uh, from Bernard Lapp. Um, so obviously centralization has been a topic we've touched upon. So Bernard's question is, the, the centralization is not based at the liquid staking pool level, but on the infrastructure level. Um, if we see more cloud providers like Hetzner shutting down nodes, so for for um, for background, Hetzner was a cloud provider. They shut down. They basically banned all crypto uh, staking through their network. It caused um, disruption on the Ethereum network, more significantly, more significant on the on the Solana network. Um, and so the, the question is like, how do we mitigate those those kind of risks? I'll, I'll leave it open to the for anyone to jump in there. We've got like thirty seconds, so quick answer. Staking yeah, I mean, I, I'll I'll jump in. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, I think solo staking is a huge. Uh, uh, mitigation for that uh, risk, and uh, you know we're we're a huge supporter of that uh, as well. Um, I, I think these risks are underplayed. I mean, the the Hetzner example is a, is a good one. Uh, one thing I like to frequently point out is something like a third of all ETH nodes are operating in a single data center building, uh, but you know 20 miles away from the White House and the CIA headquarters, uh, uh, which at least aesthetically is kind of unpleasant. I know they could be anywhere, but uh, the fact that you've got one building right in the epicenter of the of the U.S. Uh, regulatory regime. Uh, I mean, we Ethereans, uh, I'm sure, felt very smug and self-assured when we saw what happened to Solana. But I mean, it's it, it, that could happen literally tomorrow. Um, 
And so solo staking is a huge factor. The other uh, thing that I, I just want to mention is, and this is touching on the point with respect to governance and, and DAOs, uh, th that is better than centralized control. Um, you know, having DAOs and governance and votes and a dual voting structure, I think, is is really good and hopefully does become a, a standard. Um, but even better than that is just making it so that it is impossible to actually do harm. I mean, that's ultimately like smart contracts are there for exactly that reason. Uh, if they're written, especially in an immutable way where they can't be upgraded, there's no fuckery that could be had uh, with them. I mean, that's a whole other level of standard. I mean, I, I uh, would dream of a time when there doesn't need to be a DAO, you know, when you just trust the contract because it's been audited and you know what it's going to do so that you don't need to worry about a DAO passing a vote that, uh, you know, causes harm. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, that's, that's our, uh, that's our goal in life. Yeah. And maybe building off that um, comment from you, Mike, I almost think of, and that's a, it's a really good comment from, from Burned as well on, you know, the, the potential risks around centralization levels that happen on the infrastructure side. You can look at any modular part of the stack component as something that can create risk of single source failures. So whether that is, you know, cloud provider concentration, the concentration of a single client being operated, a single provider being utilized. So one of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about, and I know this, you know, panel has contributed tremendously in the space is really thinking about these parameters as ways to actively mitigate or actively reduce um, single point of failure correlation, right? So that means, you know, building an active set that has multi-cloud resiliency or spread, multi-region spread, multi, you know, client diversification ratios that, you know, ensure that there is some level of protection in the case of client bugs that can create network-wide outages or correlated failures. I mean, it's actually these parameters, I think that, you know, the space is collectively doing tremendous work on at the moment um, to advance and create, you know, a lot more secure, a lot more decentralized products around. Yeah, again, completely agree. And actually, one of the things that Bernard mentioned was that the centralization risk is, is not based on the LS pool level, it's mainly on infrastructure. And we've obviously discussed infrastructure just now, but I'd actually slightly disagree with that comment. As long as there is smart contract and governance risk, then there is very much risk that is on the LS pool level as well. And that's something that certainly needs to be um, considered. Mike mentioned immutable contracts. That'll be fantastic. Um, it's very difficult on a network that's constantly being upgraded like Ethereum is right now. But who knows? One day we'll have uh, hopefully removed those LS, uh, the smart contract risks as well. All righty. We really need to wrap it up now. So I appreciate everyone on the panel for um, their contribution. I would normally say we'd stick around and allow people to come and speak to us in person, but it's obviously impossible online. So I guess it's very easy to say everyone will be free to, to connect on LinkedIn. Like feel free to reach out. We will be very much happy to answer questions uh, there. But that is everything from us. I uh, appreciate your time and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for wrapping up the panel and everyone for joining. Uh, make sure to follow Lido, Etherfy, ClaySec, Alluvia, Stakewise, and Rocket Pool on Twitter and uh, connect uh, with these speakers on LinkedIn. And now I'm super excited to welcome Justin Drake, Ethereum researcher at the Ethereum Foundation, for a talk um, where we go a little bit into the details of the Shanghai upgrade. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's, it's so great to have you on board here and talk through the impact and opportunities of the withdrawals, um, basically the final realization of the proof of stake vision for Ethereum. Um, this is a very exciting moment in time, I think, and we're very glad to have you here and fill us in with some of the details. Please kick it off, Justin. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me. So yes, today I'm going to be uh, speaking about uh, withdrawals. I'm going to try and focus on some of the, the second order effect uh, and try and kind of walk through very, very quickly on, on the basics. So in terms of basics, we have a fork coming up, the Chapella fork, which is uh, a fork to both the execution layer and the consensus layer happening together. So it's Shanghai and Capella happening together, handling Chapella. And um, it's happening very soon because we've made so much progress on, on development on te and testing. We've had the Sepolia testnet in February uh, today, 
the 14th of March, we have the uh, girly uh, test net, which hopefully should should go through uh, smoothly. Um, and then if, if, if it does go smoothly, then uh, we will likely see a um, main net uh, in, in, in April. Now, um, as you probably all know, there's like these two different types of withdrawals at play. Uh, one is this idea of partial withdrawals. Basically, your issuance rewards, um, which accrue to your beacon chain uh, balance, will be automatically sweeped um, to, the, to the EVM so that you can unlock, for example, restaking and, and compounding. And then there's this idea of full withdrawals, which is that if you want to exit your validator completely, then, then, then you can do so. And then there's also two types of so-called withdrawal credentials. There's the 0x00, which is the, the legacy BLS pub key hash. Uh, and then there's this uh, 0x01, um, uh, um, basically Ethereum address. Uh, but these are kind of technical details that, uh, that we can skip because there's this amazing video. Uh, it's an, an 11 minute uh, video by um, Jacob from Finmatics. And it, it kind of goes through all these basic mechanics of, of withdrawals. Um, and I guess this video kind of gives me the opportunity to, to skip ahead to some of the, um, you know, maybe a little less discussed uh, second do uh, order um, impacts. So there's going to be two, two parts to this talk. Um, and it's basically going to be a, a grab bag of, of observations. So in part one, we have uh, seven sections, uh, solo staking, liquid staking, token li liquidity, compounding, the staking curve, acquisitions, fragmentation, and rekeying. And then in part two, we also have um, seven different uh, topics. Okay, so let's talk about solo staking. So in my opinion, the, uh, the advent of withdrawals is a huge improvement for, for solo stakers. Really for them, it's, it's a zero to one moment where suddenly they can get liquidity on, on their stake. So, Solo stakers already enjoy zero fees and, and full control um, over the, 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 the validators. And now they have this, this new superpower, uh, which is uh, liquidity. Um, now, one thing I do want to note is that liquid staking tokens will also uh, have uh, kind of improved liquidity. And this was discussed in, in the previous panel, where basically uh, right now we have this, this soft peg um, you know, where there's like moderate liquidity and sometimes, it, the, you know, you, you start losing the peg. And, you know, with withdrawals, we're going to have this incentive for arbitrageurs to come in and that should, should provide much higher liquidity and, and a hard, harder peg. And um, basically the, the point I'm trying to make here is that, yes, there is an improvement for the liquid staking uh, tokens from a liquidity standpoint, but really most of the improvements are for the, the, the solo validator. So one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping is that we'll see more of a migration, more of a pull towards these, these, these solo validators, which um, you know, are the, the baseline of, of the health of the ecosystem. Now, uh, an, another topic is, is compounding. Now, so we, we, we already can do compounding um, with the execution rewards. Those are automatically sent uh, to the EVM, they're basically MEV rewards. Um, and now we're going to be able to do the same thing with issuance. So MEV is on the order of 1,000 Ether a day, and issuance is about twice as much as that on the order of 2,000 Ether a day. And what I think will happen, roughly speaking, is that half of it will go towards paying taxes and going for profit. So you can think of that as a sell pressure. Um, and then the, the other 1K will be restaked for compounding, at least in the short term, while well, we're in this period of, of high growth for the, the total amount uh, which is being staked. So this is the, the so-called staking curve, which is basically the amount of ETH that has been uh, staked since, um, since the very beginning. The, I think it was the 3rd of November, 2020, 860 days ago. And one of the things that I find amazing with this curve is uh, the fact that it's so linear. So we now have about 15% of all the, 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 the ETH that is being uh, staked. And this is a, a rate of roughly 20,000 ETH per day, which is you know, a staggering amount of, of ETH, a, a huge amount of value. But it's constantly every single day uh, increasing the economic security uh, of Ethereum. And now you might ask, 
you know, ask me, you know, what is your opinion on, on what the future could hold in terms of the staking curve? And uh, my answer is that it's, it's basically going to continue. Like, um, like my, my, my best guess is that, you know, over the next, you know, 860 days, we're going to see a similar kind of growth. And so we'll be at a point, you know, maybe in uh, you know, two to three years uh, where we'll have about 30% of, of, of you staked. And, and one of the, the reasons why um, why is because there's you know the you know as more and more ETH get staked, it becomes harder and harder to convince uh, the remaining ETH to come in. But you know we have this adoption curve, right? And I think we're going to be able to bring in some of the more conservative um, ETH holders to, to to staking because you know we have more liquidity, for example, and 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 potentially all sorts of other second order consequences that I'll talk about. But if if you want to kind of zoom in into some of the, the the little micro detail, what I expect will happen is that it won't be exactly a straight line. There's going as soon as we we have the the the, the, the Shanghai fork, there's going to be this uh, this period of, of of maximum churn, and the reason is that um, there's two queues in in the um, in the in the beacon chain for validators. There's an activation queue and an exit queue. And what I expect will happen is that as soon as we allow for withdrawals, a lot of the, the validators are going to churn around. There's going to be some rekeying happening. Valid stake is going to go away and come back. And I'm going to talk about this as to you know, reasons for this churn. But then ultimately, I believe that the, the demand for ETH is just going to keep on going. And then after this period of, of max churn, where basically the, the total amount of ETH stays stays constant because there's you know an equal amount of validators leaving the system than there are entering the system and so it kind of cancels out um, I'm expecting kind of a, a, a period of catching up to this uh, to the stagnation um, the stagnation which could last several months you know maybe two to three months and then we should back up to the trend line of roughly 20,000 eve per day okay so one of the questions you can ask yourself is, you know, why would we have this this kind of this period of several months potentially of maximum churn? And uh, you know, one of the reasons is that we've 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 seen acquisitions. So, for example, we've seen Coinbase acquire Bison Trails, we've seen Kraken um, acquire uh, a state, and um, you know, in the process of acquisition, you, you're changing owner, and so it's kind of a good practice to rekey your validators. So, if you had some sort of sysadmin in the previous organization that had special rights over you know, the staking keys, for example, or the withdrawal keys. And you might want to, to, to rekey those so that the, effectively the, the permissions uh, are, are, are updated to reflect the, the, the new owners. But there's also been uh, other acquisitions. Um, you know, uh, Jump Capital has acquired Certus and, and Block Demon has acquired uh, AnyBlock. So that's gonna lead to a lot of churn you know, not necessarily a cause for, for, for panic if we see lots of validators leaving. And the reason is that, you know, I think more likely than not, they're just churning and they'll be coming back right back in uh, through the uh, activation queue and, and, and clogging both the, the exit and the activation queue. Um, another, you know, thing that I expect will happen is basically churn because of fragmentation. So we, we've had the recent news with Kraken uh, where they're kind of forced to fragment and 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 you know split, for example, the the U.S. business and 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 the non-U.S. business. And Kraken has has indicated that they're going going to be setting up a new entity uh, for for staking, and that's possible. That's going to lead to basically a lot of churn and 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 rekeying, even for the non-U.S. Uh, customers that can that can remain uh, staking customers of Kraken. And then another thing that might happen is, you know, what I'm calling competitive fragmentation. Is this idea that, um, you know, maybe some of the um, some of the operators are are kind of operating for that direct competitors. So one of one of the things that um, you know I, I've noticed as 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 an operator of the ultrasound relay is that very recently, both Coinbase and Kraken kind of simultaneously connected on mass. Uh, to the ultrasound relay, and that kind of suggests that there's some sort of common operator uh, for for both these, these these companies. And of course, you know that's a bit of an awkward situation where 
you know, as an operator, you're, you're, you're controlling validators of your direct competitors. So, so I, I, I think what will happen is that there's going to be some fragmentation there. It could be that the common operator is Bison Trails oper acquired by Coinbase. It could be staked uh, acquired by, by, by Kraken. And then another thing that I, that I expect is basically fragmentation purely from a, uh, a, a, a standpoint of, of, ma of maturation of the ecosystem. So what tends to happen is that users, you know, they, they, they come into the ecosystem and they're, they're, they're new, maybe they come in through Coinbase, they don't have a lot of, of, of knowledge and they're willing to pay a 25% fee, but then over time, you know, they educate themselves, they, they learn um, about Ethereum and, and maybe the prospect of, of solo staking isn't that scary after all. And there's all these advantages, for example, the fact that you, you, you don't have to pay this 25% fee and the fact that you know, there's this activist element to it whereby you know, you're actively helping the, the, the health of the, the Ethereum ecosystem. So you know, it's been over two years since uh, staking uh, started and, it, and two years in the blockchain space is, is an eternity. And so um, I expect a, a lot of newbies that maybe started staking uh, you know, a couple of years ago will be you know, experts and hopefully will be willing to move away from, from places like Coinbase to, to solo staking and they're incentivized to do so because they're, they're be saving a lot of money on, on fees. And then another kind of uh, final reason for, um, for, for churn is the, the various sources of rekeying. So for example, Lido um, has this, um, this BLS multisig, uh, it's a six of 11 multisig that holds about 600,000 ETH. And as I understand that plan is basically to move away from this multisig and upgrade everything uh, to, to, to the small contract. And, and that could lead to, 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 some, uh, to, some, to some churn. Um, actually, now that I think about it, uh, what they can probably just do is just point their existing validators to the, uh, to the, Ethereum, con to the to their Ethereum contract. So actually they could probably do that without uh, any churn, uh, which is great, great news for us. Um, and you know, and I guess another reason for uh, for for churn might be that these operators have you know improved the way that they generate staking keys. So they, you know, the keys might be generated by fancy MPCs or by fancy hardware or by you know using some sort of custodian. And you, because you have new standards for generating keys, now you have an opportunity to rekey, and that's going to going to lead to some churn. So basically, conclusion of this section is that, you know, we're going to see, I, my, I hope, I, I expect kind of a, a continuation of this, of this trend, you know, 14% uh, of all ETH state is, is in the grand scheme of things, not a lot, especially when you compare it to other proof of stake protocols. And so I'm kind of expecting this, this, this growth to continue, um, you know, for another couple of years. And you know, there's going to be a little bit of turbulence and a little bit of congestion shortly after uh, withdrawals are, are activated because there's going to be a lot of churn, but uh, that, that's merely a, a temporary phenomenon. Okay, um, so in, the, in this you know, second part of my talk, I'm going to go through you know, another grab bag of, of seven different uh, uh, topics. Uh, vampire attacks, airdrops, taxes, censorship, which is a bit surprising why the censorship come in, anti-slashing, insurance, uh, and, and hacks. And I, I hope you find you know, some of these topics uh, interesting. So the, the first one is this idea of, of vampire attacks. So we've had, for example, Susie Schwab do um, a vampire attack on, on, on Uniswap. And maybe there's an opportunity here to, to, to perform a, you know, some sort of vampire attacks uh, on, 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 on liquid taking uh, tokens. So just as, as an example here, like the, the largest player in the space, Lido, I think they have about 31% of validators. Well, one of the things that could happen is some of the competitors trying to launch these vampire attacks. And um, you know, one very simple way of doing it is basically inviting um, holders, long, long time holders of staked ETH to um, you know, send their staked ETH to this competitive smart contract this, smart, this competitive smart contract will automatically kind of sell the staked ETH and then use the proceeds to, to, to stake on this other, uh, you know, 
platform and there could be incentives at play. There could be, for example, uh, you know, no fees for some period of time, for example, no fees for one year, or there could be uh, token incentives uh, for, for, for these vampire attacks. And I think this is a, an opportunity uh, for, uh, for upstarts to try and uh, you know, compete with the, uh, with, with the incumbents. Another uh, kind of interesting uh, dynamic uh, around withdrawals is, is, is airdrops. So we, we haven't really seen this so far. I think the only example may have been a, a POAP if you're one of the, uh, the, the early validators, but I'm fully expecting um, all sorts of, of, of you know, incentives for, for validators to perform tasks in the future. You know, we, we, we know of Eigenlayer, for example, and there could be this, this, this idea of retroactive airdrop, which depends on how old your validator is among other, other different uh, you know, considerations. And so there's a conundrum for you, which is, do you want to, uh, to, 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 to rekey or do you not want to rekey? If, you, if you're rekeying, which means exiting the validator and creating a new validator um, with, with new keys, then you potentially uh, jeopardize your, your airdrop. So there's, there's a bit of a, a conundrum here. Like, do you want to rekey and maybe benefit from uh, the, 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 the security improvements of rekeying or whatever reason you, you're, you're rekeying, or do you want to, uh, to, to be uh, you know, maximizing your chances of, of getting a, 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 a big airdrop? Okay, another uh, topic that I've seen discussed is uh, taxes. So when the, uh, the withdrawals happen, there's basically gonna be this cliff where around 1.1 million uh, of, of issuance suddenly becomes uh, available. And you know, one could naively say, okay, this is a, a massive tax event um, whereby the issuance, you know, which is you know, considered to be income in, in, in most jurisdictions is, um, you know, needs to be, needs to be sold off. Now th I have a few kind of counterpoints to, to this, uh, to this uh, concern. One of them is that, um, you know, if you are already working in the context of, of liquid st staking tokens, then you, you're kind of accruing, uh, you know, this, 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 this issuance uh, already um, on a continuous basis. There's, there's no notion of cliff. Um, so that, that greatly mitigates the, the, the cliff. Another aspect, I guess, is that some stakers may have chosen to pay income on issuance uh, on a continuous basis. And, and this is, you know, I'm talking from, from personal experience. I, I, my, for my validator, I'm actually, I'm, I've been paying taxes every single year. Uh, and I, I haven't been waiting until I have access to this issuance to, 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 to pay my, my, my taxes. So these taxes have already been paid for uh, in the past. And even in the case where, um, you know, th there is some sort of, 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 of cliff, um, you know, the different jurisdictions will require taxes to be paid at, at different points in time. So the, the, the sell pressure kind of is spread out over, over a, a whole year. And I guess another final comment here is that um, paying for taxes because of this issuance, issuance cliff shouldn't lead to uh, stakers on staking. And the reason is that um, you can use these partial withdrawals um, basically only take a subset of the issuance and pay pay for the taxes from that. There's no need to touch the, the 32 ETH principal amount uh, to, to, pay, to, to pay for your taxes. Okay, another um, uh, interesting topic is uh, OFAC uh, censorship. So one of the things that I expect is withdrawals to improve um, the 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 the, the, the censorship uh, situation for 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 relay. So right now we're in a position where the most popular relay is the flashbots relay, and it's a it's a censoring relay. Um, and you know there's there's various competitors to the to the flashbots relay. There's the ultrasound relay, and the, the agnostic relay, for example, and Estes relay. But some of the the validators haven't yet connected. Um, and the, the fact that we have a hard fork coming up 
is a shelling point, kind of a forcing function for validators to go ahead and, and upgrade. And so roughly one third of rocket pool operators are, are basically running an old version of, of, of the software and they should be making an upgrade uh, in, in the coming weeks. And that should improve the situation from a, a censorship perspective. Um, and then a, a, another uh, interesting player is, is Celsius. So Celsius is only connected to the, to the Flashbot uh, relay. So they you know, have a very bad footprint um, you know, from, from the perspective of, of relay censorship. But the good news is that you know, more likely than not, the administrators of Celsius will start liquidating uh, this, this, uh, this, this stake thief, exiting it, um, and, and this, this ETH that's withdrawn will be able to re-enter the system through new operators uh, and, 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 and hopefully not, not, not have uh, as much uh, of, a, of a censorship uh, footprint. Okay, um, uh, another interesting topic is uh, anti-slashing. So one of the ways to, uh, to have very high grade uh, security for your, your keys is to use trusted, uh, trusted hardware. Um, and the one, one such instance is, is called uh, SGX uh, from, from Intel. And um, a few months ago, I, I wrote this post called uh, a liquid solo validating. And basically the, the, the idea is that you can use Intel SGX as the, the recipient of your staking key. So the, there's a unique copy of your staking key in the machine in the so-called enclave. And the enclave provides guarantees that it will not produce a slashable message. It will not sign a message that could lead to slashing. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of very powerful because it, it allows you to, 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 to build, a, you know, basically a, a liquid staking token for, for solo validators. But it's also helpful for, for anyone in the ecosystem because, um, you know, you, you can be using uh, a basically uh, trusted hardware as a way to safeguard your, 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 your staking keys. It's a little bit like having a hardware wallet uh, for, for, your, for holding your funds. It's good practice. You don't wanna be putting your staking keys on a, on a, on, on a, on a hot wallet, which is uh, what's, what most people, at least the, you know, the, the home validators would, would, would be doing. And there's actually a, a project that has gone ahead and implemented this you know, through the support of uh, the Ethereum Foundation grant, uh, Puffer.Finance has implemented this uh, SGX-based anti-slashing. And so the, uh, the, the withdrawals uh, fork is a great shelling point to consider using this kind of very advanced uh, hardware protection against, uh, against slashing. And not only does it protect against uh, hackers um, you know, potentially having access to your keys, but it also provide, prevents against kind of accidental uh, leakage or even inside jobs. Even a, a rogue sysadmin, you know, within the, uh, the, you know, as an employee, for example, of an operator can't go ahead and extract those, those, those signing keys or produce a slashable message, which is a, a, a great level of, of confidence. And one of the things that I, I expect technologies like this uh, will will allow is for for more insurance. So, um, I've, I've 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 tried to have a look in terms of uh, which uh, service providers you know provide uh, insurance. And I, I saw, for example, Figments has some form of insurance, um, and a Nexus Mutual is also providing some form of insurance. But with uh, with Intel SGX, you can actually have a, a a provable kind of cryptographic attestation that comes from the enclave that proves that your, your, your staking key was generated within the enclave. And that could be a receipt, which is verifiable on chain that could unlock decentralized insurance or you know, provide high, high guarantees to a centralized insurer to ensure you against slashing. Okay, uh, final, final slide. Uh, and then I'm happy to, to take questions if there's, if there's time. Um, so, one, one, the topic here is what happens if, if oops.
Oh, I think you're muted, Justin. Um, if you can just unmute yourself, yeah. Sorry about that. My my alarm went off. Um, <laughs> so awesome. the yeah, uh, we are running a little bit out of time, but uh, maybe you you can just uh, wrap it up in like uh, a few sentences, and then we can move over to the next panel. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, so yeah, this is my basically my last slide. I was it's basically highlighting what could happen if you do get hacked. So there's there's three different types of hacks. Uh, that could happen. You could have your BLS withdraw key hacked, which is the 0x0. You could have the 0x01 withdraw key uh, hacked, which is basically your, your firm address, which will receive the funds and uh, the, the, the staking key. Um, and they're, they're basically, there's all sorts of, of races that can happen with the attacker. There's a, a ransom attack that can happen as well. And I guess just for the just for brevity, I'm, I'll focus on, on, on the 0x01 withdrawal key because it's kind of a, a, a fun kind of uh, you know, potential move that you can do if you know that you've been hacked. So basically what I suggest doing if, if you know that you've been hacked is to actually create a, a, a transaction which sends your full balance as a validator. So it could be you know, 32 ETH plus all the issuance that you've accrued, all of, all of that value, basically send it as a, as a tip, um, as, as a priority fee uh, to, to, to the, the, the next validator, basically. So what will happen is that validators will pick the highest paying block uh, with, with MEV boost, and they're basically incentivized to pick the block that pays them the most. And if you, you pay your full hacked balance to the next validator, that next validator will go pick it up. And the reason, you know, it's maybe best to give all that money to the next validator is that at least you're not giving it to the attacker. At least the attacker can't go uh, pick it up. And, and so what you can do is that, you know, if, you, if the validator happens to be Lido or Coinbase or whatever, you can give them proof that these were you know, stolen funds and you should, should be the, the, the owner of these funds, for example, by proving that you control the deposit address uh, and then it allows you to potentially recover, recover your funds. And that, that is my last slide. Thanks. Awesome. Oh, that, that was so great, Justin. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. I think this, this was an amazing presentation and everyone, like we also have the live recording. So uh, always feel free to check back the YouTube recording um, to listen to all the panels and talks today. Um, really, re really great talk on the impacts um, of the Ethereum upgrade for um, the immediate short term. Um, seeing probably a little bit of stagnation there um, for the East staked, um, uh, but then taking back on the upwards trend. Um, so this is great, amazing insights, Justin. Really, thank you for being here. Um, and speaking about that, uh, we just going to move over to the next panel, um, talking about uh, staking compliance and exploring the regulatory as well as practical challenges hindering broader institutional adoption for Ethereum staking. This is, uh, again, uh, moderated by Alison, uh, who we had earlier talking about staking regulation. Thanks for being here again. Um, and uh, Alison is joined by Brian uh, from Ether Capital, the first public company who offers Ethereum staking. Um, great to have you on board. And Kuhan from Consensus Code for Staking, leading liquid white label solution for e-staking, um, leading a lot of efforts there on making staking more compliant as well. And uh, last but not least, we have Ernie from Kiln, uh, building enterprise grade staking at uh, Kiln Finance. Please kick it off, Alison. All right, thanks Mirko and um, thanks to all of you for joining us. I uh, wanna just kick off maybe briefly, there's been a lot of conversation today on various other panels um, about regulatory compliance, barriers to adoption. So maybe just to kick things off at the highest level. Um, and Ernie, I'll start with you and then we can kind of go around. What do you see as the barriers to broader adoption of staking more generally? Where do you you see the knowledge gap if there is one institutions who are looking to enter the space uh, what it, and, and again i don't want to put words in your mouth maybe you'll say no every, everything's great everyone knows everything they need to know but assuming that there is one um what do you think we need to do to move things forward yeah sure um hi everyone it's great to, great to see you and congrats on, a, on an awesome conference uh some really interesting chats um so yeah i think in terms of um in terms of Barriers to adoption. I think um, 
when we're talking about ETH in particular, obviously there's uh, there's liquidity, right? And Shanghai is coming up. That's going to be one big barrier that gets removed, right? So enabling everyone to um, to withdraw. Uh, I think the next one after that that will help reduce risks is dual exit withdrawals. If that comes in at the protocol level, it will enable uh, basically the end holders of e staked ETH to uh, fully um, trigger exits without having to rely on the um, the node operator in case they're not, you know, if they're using a, a, a third party service to operate the nodes, it won't have to trust the node operator to exit their, their validator. I think that's going to reduce a, a barrier as well. Um, I think just kind of more on um, uh, product integration level, I think there's still a, a number of custodians, uh, custodian products that are being used by institutional uh, customers that are not fully um, ready to, to, to support staking. Um, sometimes it's possible to do it, for example, like via the UI, but not via the API of the custodian or vice versa. And I think this kind of thing adds friction to teams that are trying to integrate staking into, into their products, particularly in like a white label um, automated context, right? If a FinTech app or something like that wants to integrate staking. So I think that's gonna, uh, that, that's something that should improve over time. And maybe the last one I would say is just around, yeah, the, you were mentioning knowledge gaps. There's some, yeah, it's a complex system. I think teams need to take time to to ramp up, and um, there are topics like slashing, like modeling slashing risk, that are complicated and probably could do with more kind of uh, tools and, and 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 models out there to to help explain this kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what I would say. Brian, you see similar yeah. anything to add there? I mean, it depends on, on what it looks like in terms of an institution. So we helped put together the first uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs, true spot ETFs up in Canada. We would love to help put together a staking ETF. And that specifically, that type of a structured product comes along with all sorts of complications, everything down from who is the custodian, um, what are the expectations a regulator would have around monitoring for slashing events? You know, what kind of tooling uh, would be needed? Um, we're structured Ether Capital as, as a corp. Uh, we're staking about 36,000 ETH. But we have all sorts of um, just different requirements to do quarterly filing. So we have to meet IFRS or GAAP accounting standards. We have to mark the price of ETH at a certain time of the day. And the kind of tools just haven't really emerged yet in the ecosystem. Uh, we're working on them. There's lots of other great folks out there working on them. So there's lots of pieces of the puzzle that need to come into play. As Ernest was saying, you know, liquidity around uh, withdrawing your ETH from being staked is something that's important because if you imagine something like an ETF where you would have daily liquidity, what does the ETF do to, to hedge the, the price during that time? What happens if something goes wrong during that period? And so this is where regulators are, are still trying to figure out what's, a, what's appropriate. And maybe in that ETF, you wouldn't be able to stake 100% of the ETH. Maybe it's 10% of the ETH and over time they allow that that product to ramp up closer to 25% or 50%. The fantasy would be to get it as close, of course, to 100%. So I still think we're, we're a bit away from this becoming a reality. There's still pieces of the puzzle uh, that need to be solved, but we'll get there as, as an industry. Uh, it's certainly the ability to withdraw the stake teeth is a huge um, upgrade um, or move towards that. The last thing I'll say from what I'm seeing is someone who, who has a fair number of discussions with regulators and trying to figure out how to do a structured product, without, you know, I, I'm going to duck when I say this comment. Um, the, the liquid staking derivative tokens, I don't see being the answer, at least right now. I'm, I'm not sure. But I think that that's going to be harder to convince the appropriateness for something like an ETF. For family offices or institutions that want to just have exposure and abstract way the complexity, maybe. But I think inside of a structured product like an ETF specifically, it's stacking risk on top of something that's already really complex. And I don't know that the comfort level is there yet uh, where that will be the way to create these types of products to bring to market? So let me push you on that a little bit, um, it, particularly with regard to these ETFs and talking about liquid staking tokens. I mean, obviously you're saying it's, it's kind of risk on top of risk. What are the conversations do you think that would need to happen? Or do you think it's just inherent in the way that these liquid staking protocols are being structured? Like, what do you think 
would um, make it more of the answer, so to speak, just to push back on the premise. Well, if you, if you think about in Canada, you have an actual spot ETF. So one-to-one -one daily liquidity, the US, you only have a futures-based set of ETFs uh, that are out, far less efficient, far less um, ideal for, for a retail investor. Um, the comfort level has to be around custody. It has to be around how staking works, what kind of counterparty uh, risk there is. Certainly in a post-FTX world, you have the SEC, the Ontario Securities Commission, you have all these regulators saying, what risk is there to these counterparties? What exposure do you have there? And how do you mitigate it? And the knowledge gap is, is so, like to Ernest's point, there's a huge knowledge gap here where you say, okay, well, staking has all these different complexities. You know, there's differences between nominated proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, proof of stake. They don't know what those things, they don't know what those things are. They first have to get comfortable with those things before they would accept some type of derivative on top of that. They do want to know if something happens to your counterparty because, you know, BlackRock, I, I imagine, isn't going to be running their own validators. They're going to, you know, partner with people like Kiln, with Figment, lots of, you know, great staking providers out there. Um, and so what happens if one of those goes offline or disappears the way that, you know, FTX, people assumed it was safe and then, you know, gone to the assets. So will it require them to learn how to get a copy of the exit transaction that they could broadcast if needed? Maybe. So I think that that piece of the puzzle needs to be worked out before you could say, we're going to create this derivative token that may have different liquidity or not quite match, you know, one-to-one -to, -one to the value of, of the staked ether. Um, that would have to be sorted out, I imagine, first, be well documented and understood um, before you would see that product come to market. The only way that I would say that I could see it happening is in some type of a closed fund or OM structure. Um, so not necessarily a true ETF, but a different type of product maybe would say it's it's cleaner to use one of these liquid tokens because they're not marking to market daily, quarterly, monthly. Uh, and so maybe that that is where that um, that asset would fit for now. Yeah, and I don't want to hijack the panel. I mean, I think there's some um, question and maybe we would have different opinions on whether these things actually should be viewed as derivatives or perhaps something else, but I'm going to yep. bracket that and build on something else that you just said, which is when you're thinking about um, the various types of staking and just the level of education, right, that, that needs to happen in order for people to become comfortable with these things. Um, and I said this earlier, I saw a lot of other people say this on different panels earlier, um, but I do think there is it's not even just that we need to educate them on the different kinds of staking and how these things differ from one another. Um, but we need to talk about misconceptions surrounding staking and how those might color discussions with various institutional players that are looking to enter the space. So um, Kuhan, maybe over to you because you haven't jumped in yet. Um, how do you see um, us being able to deal with maybe challenging some of the misconceptions we're seeing surrounding staking or being more precise in terms of the definitions, educating people and getting where we need to be. Yeah, so I definitely think it's more of the latter. I mean, look, for all of us in this space, we're so in we're so inside it, we forget what it's like from the outside. So I don't think the misunderstanding is unsurprising, whether that be with potential customers, whether that be with regulators, compliance, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, put yourselves in their shoes, okay? So someone says, oh, come on, come and uh, come and stake some ETH. Get some ETH, go and stake it, it's great. Okay, first of all, it's not returns, it's rewards. Getting those rewards is based on fulfilling duties. What the hell are duties? Uh, the reward isn't fixed. There's no such thing as a kind of yield or a real APR that they can track. It's all historical. There's consensus layer, execution layer. There's no exits until now. There's, you know, how does staking work? So there is a lot of complexity and imagine I've had so many of these conversations over the last two years. And I think, and Alison, you touched on it in the forum, in your panel, I mean, in your talk earlier, um, the first point to start this process to talk about the different models available. And I won't get into the detail because you did talk about them, but just briefly for those who missed it, solo staking, self staking, custodial staking, self-custodial kind of staking as a service and um, smart contract liquid staking, I guess are the four that people normally talk about. And for someone who's new to staking, that's, that's a lot of variation with lots of, and this is the killer bit, I think, lots of important nuance in the detail. It, it, it's 
And what happens is you end up having technical and operational discussions with institutions and individuals who are just focused on pure investment decisions. And before you know it, your engagement with that institution starts spreading and bifurcating across their organization until it's very difficult to get give them real clarity of what they're actually trying to do. Um, and I think one of the things I'm really personally, I'm very keen on is to emphasize that there's no equivalent traditional financial instrument to staking. It is one of the few things in Web3 that has that quality, you know, and I think it's something we have to emphasize rather than drawing what I consider to be false parallels. Um, and I actually think the current environment and the last 12 months present a massive opportunity for us to kind of really differentiate between those risks and properties that are innate to the protocol, so technical, operational security, versus those that belong solely to the model that you happen to be employing. And far too often, we throw them all into a big pot, and so potential stakers get really confused about what they're trying to do. Um, so in terms of kind of coloring discussions, um, aside from the kind of how much rewards can I get and how much does it cost, I end up always talking about risk and institutions have to figure out what best fits their risk appetite. And I know we're going to talk about this in a minute, um, but I think taking this approach will help new customers to really understand staking properly. And we have to take the time to continue to do that. I'm, to an extent, I'm sure all of us are a bit tired of doing it, but we need to continue. And, um, and I think this will create further separation. And perhaps this is a bit of an interesting discussion Brian and I can have between finance and TradFi and its equivalents in Web3 and staking, which I think is very different. Well, maybe let's can just can I just add in one? Say, let's pull down that thread a little bit. So, so Brian, over to you. I, I actually just wanted to add a, a separate point, which is that in all my discussions, like I spend my time between Toronto and, and New York, you know, the a lot of the institutions forget staking for a minute. They're not even sure yet that they want to own ETH as an asset. You know, Bitcoin has a really clean narrative. They they there was some buy-in or a decent amount of buy-in in that kind of second half of 2020 onwards uh, while the you know, price was going up. Um, and then ETH has a more complex narrative. There's more education to do around, you know, what are the use cases for this asset? Why is it important to own? Forget staking, you know, just why you should want to own ETH. And with everything that's happening right now with, with regulators and failure of, of just traditional banks, you do have a lot of uh, institutions that perhaps want to participate in the asset class, but they're going to sit on the sidelines until they feel comfortable that the U.S. isn't going to do some type of outright ban uh, or get even more aggressive than they have been. So staking comes after that. Um, I'm not saying I like this. I'm not saying it's good, it's bad. I'm, I'm just saying that I think first they have to say, yes, we want to figure out how to own this asset. Then they can get into what's the appropriate structure. And then down the line, it's, yes, we should be staking uh, because the yield on its own is is not enough, you know, 5%, whatever it is, it's going to float up down. Um, that's not enough of an incentive because the reality is the asset, the underlying asset uh, volatility is is higher than 5% in, in a single day or, or an hour. <laughs> so it's really an asset for those that can take a long-term view and say, low time preference, I just want to own this asset. I believe in the upside of it and I want to make it productive while I own it. And if they buy into our ethos of contributing to network security, Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think what's really interesting is something that you pointed out in terms of like people have now become comfortable with Bitcoin, right? And it, there used to be this narrative of like blockchain, not Bitcoin. And I think now we're seeing like blockchain and Bitcoin, but maybe not anything else. We're not sure, right? And ETH is kind of the the next jump. We have to kind of get them to feel comfortable with that. And you talked a lot about risk and different kinds of risk, and people are kind of conflating all of these things, and it ends up being a much broader discussion. At the end of the day, what do you think? And I know it's kind of hard to put like one particular pin on it. And I think the macro environment has a lot to do with that. And it's um, it leaves something to be desired uh, right now. But if you, if we're just talking about risk assessment in general, like do you think that most of the the risk that they see and which is kind of causing people to sit back on the sidelines is is it technical risk that they're discussing discussing with you? Is it operational risk? Is it uh, you know, just generally speaking, how are people thinking about this? Or is it they don't even know what they don't know? Um, Ernie, I saw you on mute, so I'll go to you first. No, I was just going to say, <clears throat> I think it's all of the above, right? Um, uh, I think, you know, 
Kuhan was saying, he spent a lot of time in these conversations. I think we, we all are, and, and there's there's different levels depending on also who you're talking to, uh, kind of on the other side. And, um, and I think there's also kind of the adoption cycle is such that there's kind of the early adopters and they're, they need to first be, as, as Brian was saying, convinced that they want to hold ETH long term before looking to stake. So I think it's important to also like segment the market that you're going after. Um, this is just going in the, putting yourself in the shoes of, uh, you know, a staking services company, right? Um, being careful not to go, not to burn yourself on, on, on things that are not going to close for, for years and years. Um, but yeah, and I think, I think another area on top of the um, education piece that Kuhan was, was explaining is also one of the great advantages of this um, form of, this kind of form of yield is that it can be very transparent. So we can build tooling, you know, we can build tooling and data services to actually show all this stuff, right? Like unlike a, unlike a bank where, you know, um, especially private companies is very, it's very hard to figure out what's going on. Public companies, it's still hard to figure out what's going on. There's some, there's like, you know, a PDF that comes out once in a while somewhere, <laughs> but with, with our, with our industry, we have the ability to, to provide real time, uh, data uh, and from several sources that can confirm what's happening and, and, and prove that things are being done well. I think that's super exciting. I think, I think that that's a great point. So, and that kind of adds to one of the qualities that this ecosystem brings to the rest of the kind of space is in that transparency and actually think uh, enabling regulators or institutions to think differently about market structure. I, I, I do get concerned about everyone really focusing on the need for a regulated custodian and you've got to have a custodian in place. But actually, when you have settlement and execution in the same transaction, why do you really need a custodian? I think we need to be able to push and engage with the regulators to think more clearly about what they're trying to achieve rather than the method that they used to use to achieve those things in traditional finance. That's I think that's part, it's partially important for them to under, I mean, I, I, I mostly agree. And it's important that regulators understand that custody is, is not just about check boxes on a piece of paper and, you know, being registered in various jurisdictions. It's also a tech stack. And that's something I, I think that they are aware of that it's as much or more of a technology issue uh, on top of just registration. That that's certainly important. I think part of the issue, though, is as much as um, we were talking about knowledge gaps before, right? I think that it is very exciting that a lot of this information is readily available and we can point people to that. I do think that getting people to change their mindset, um, especially when we talk about regulators, bureaucrats, not even talking about electeds, I think that process is a lot more difficult than one... Um, might assume. And so I think you'll see the focus still on things like disclosures, not to say disclosures aren't important, they're incredibly important, but a lot of the information that you would need to make a decision about a provider kind of already exists, right? I mean, if you if you think about just the nature of blockchains. Um, and so we are, it is a little bit round peg square hole, but I don't see a, a time and time in the near future where they just say, well, you know what, we, we understand this now, the information's out there and, you know, don't worry about the filling out that form on the website to register or disclosures or, or any of that. You'll go get the data yeah, via your API. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, one, all one thing I, I would also add before when you were saying, you know, what, what is it that, what is the one piece that's going to drive interest? Um, this is kind of a, a sad answer, but it's, it's a little honest. If the number goes up, people are going to want to find a way to access the assets and have exposure. And so part of the pullback uh, of interest from institutions in the last 12 months just has been a retreat in the price of all of these things. And as we get positive momentum, um, they will come back to the table and say, okay, we need to pay attention to this. And hopefully next time there's volatility on the way down, they're not going to leave. They'll just say, okay, we'll, we'll ride it out. So that will be, I think, a big catalyst to force them to figure out um, how they're going to create structured products, how they're going to participate in the space, how they can leverage their network to offer it out to their customers. Uh, a lot of it will be price driven, not not as so much tech solutions. Yeah, I mean, it, it's true. I think given the state of the market and also some of the 
the events, which we don't have to uh, revisit that, that uh, you know, happened over the past 12 months didn't, didn't really help us um, when it comes to regulators and so and institutions. So it's going to take time to rebuild the trust and it's going to take time for that interest to go up again as more people want exposure. Um, given that crypto is international, and I know, Brian, you were kind of talking about going back and forth between Toronto and New York. There's obviously many other jurisdictions that are involved here. How are you guys thinking about or dealing with compliance in different jurisdictions? Or even if you want to talk more broadly about, I think there was a question in the chat, you know, how are we, I don't know that I want to rate the U.S.'s approach to a uh, proof of stake in crypto versus other jurisdictions, um, because I think we have very little to export on that front. But how are you thinking about this multi-jurisdictional approach and how you're thinking through the different challenges based on the fact that blockchains are global? It's a um, it's a very fortunate position I think for us to be in because we are not technically a, a we're not a fund we're not an ETF we're a corporation and we basically just have uh, you know forty five thousand ETH in our treasury um, and we're staking thirty six thousand of it we don't have to comply in the same way that a, a fund would um, we run a, a multi sig uh, internally we don't have a third party custodian and that allows us to partner with with different uh, service providers to run the validators so it doesn't Really, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what's happening in the U.S. or Canada, but we're not subject to regulation uh, the same way we are as a reporting issuer because the company itself is public, but we're not facing retail. We're not facing other investors. We're not taking possession of their, you know, we're not doing those things, at least at this point in time. Um, so it's, it's a pretty fortunate uh, position to be in, but we are seeing because we sit on advisory panels or working groups for, for various um, regulatory bodies. Uh, we can see what they're thinking and what it's going to require to create those structured products uh, down the line. And so a lot of how we're looking at developing products and hopefully working with multiple staking providers to, to get them on site as well is we need more transparency. We need to know, you know, what relay are you using? Is it OFAC compliant? Yes, no. Um, can you turn on or off MEV? Um, how do you monitor you know, missed attestations, missed blocks, like how, how do you do that? And I think before you see these structured products come to, come to market, you would have to front run all those issues and then go to, you know, the SEC or OSC, CSA, you know, whatever jurisdiction you're in and say, we want to launch this product. Here are the things that we see as issues and here's how we've gone about solving them. If you just file the paperwork to say, we're going to do a staking ETF, I, Somewhere, someone in that organization is going to go, there's still, there's still too many unknowns. So the best thing you could do is, is figure out how to solve the problems of what they're already concerned about and, and then why it's appropriate to green light that product. What are you guys, Con, want to go over to you? From our side, because we're completely non-custodial and essentially a technology provider, we've focused on enabling customers who develop their own perspectives in whatever jurisdiction is relative to them or relevant for them so that they can you know pick and choose which region their validators run in what clouds what mev relays they point at all that kind of flexibility is available so that they can decide for themselves rather than us kind of say hey this is this is the truth because as you rightly point out almost implied in the question that's kind of impossible right so we just enable people to pick and choose for themselves and then they can move forward from there. We just focus on remaining a technical provider that is focused on the tech and non-custodial. They do the rest. Well, I mean, speaking of being a technical provider, there, there are, there is in fact, I mean, cyber risk and vulnerabilities and things like that to consider. Uh, I mean, so Ernie, how are you dealing with that? And then if you guys have anything to add. Yes. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so so I think there's kind of no no magic right on the cyber risk and vulnerability. It's just it's just a lot of work, a lot of regular constant attention to these topics. Um, they need to be prioritized well in the company um, ahead of kind of feature velocity, right? Um, security is the thing that <laughs> Kuhan, as a fellow product product person, you know you know the trade offs, right? Um, but um, and so so for us, it's just a lot of penetration tests. Uh, audits um, for things that, you know, like, for example, we're SOC 2 audited, um, which helps with a lot of our customers. And then for smart contracts that we develop, we, 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 we do several audits as well. And then just having a culture of, um, of really not compromising on, on security, I think, is, is just the way 
um, the way to deal with it. Um, Did you want to jump in there, or did he? Uh... Um, no, uh, yeah, as, uh, as Ernie said, I, I think one of the things to touch on is that actually it's really important. Whilst we all focus on security, the final outcome of that security is important, that we all do it differently, so that we maintain another level of diversity uh, across the ecosystem. And I think that whilst it's great, and it's great, we have these standards like SOC two and ISO, um, and we have to keep moving forward with those, as Ernie said, but is that differentiation between different providers will give strength to the whole uh, network itself, right? So I think that's important. Yeah. All right, maybe a final one, and then we can open it up if, if we have time. Uh, we may have used all the time, but we'll see. Um, a, a final one for all of you. We talked about the differences between, you know, bull market, bear market, um, more institutions kind of sitting on the sidelines, and when demand goes up, they'll want to get involved again. What do you think about compliance specifically? Like how much of, of the, the institutional participation do you think is limited due to um, maybe not inability to comply, but the, the fogginess surrounding compliance, especially in some key jurisdictions? And do you think that if there is clarity, and I'm, I hate using the phrase regulatory clarity because I don't think it's all about regulatory clarity. I think it's about getting the clarity that you need in order for these things to thrive because there's a certain kind of clarity that you don't want, right? Like if you say there's an outright ban, that's clarity, but it's not necessarily the clarity you might want. But do you think that provided there is some sort of sensible guidelines that more institutions will get involved? Or do you think that there's, there, it, this is really driven by other things and it's not necessarily a compliance first issue? Anyone who wants to jump in, I I would say that it's it's a bit of clarity, but then the best practices. I don't think that knowledge is is in house at a lot of the the big structure product manufacturers. Uh, that's an opportunity for you know everyone on this panel, everyone in this industry, uh, to act as those um, consultants, service providers, working together to say there's never going to be a point in time where. The tech is there, set it and forget it, click a button and walk away. The industry will continue to evolve. Better best practices will emerge that replace the old ones. New opportunities uh, will continue to present themselves. So right now we're mostly talking about just, you know, e vanilla staking, but then throw in something like Agen layer, and then you're going to have more people going, well, this is fantastic. I want to participate in that as well. So that's a big opportunity for the industry uh, to work with um, these uh, traditional institutions and say there's a knowledge gap that will always be there. You will always yeah. need us to help you figure out what the right compliance is to guide you uh, on that journey of creating those products. Um, and I think that's a win for, for both sides of the table. Yeah, I think that point is well taken. I think if you think, you know, you're, you're talking about just, you know, vanilla ETH staking. Um, and when I look at it, I think about just how much more complicated ETH staking is even in these four different iterations. Like when you have things like MEV um, versus like some of the first L1s to go live with proof of stake, right? It just becomes that much more complicated. And that's just been in a couple years time. So we're just going to continue to see these new innovations, which is incredibly exciting but to your point that that knowledge gap is always going to have is always going to exist and we're always going to have to be dealing with that um okay we are i think very close on time if anyone has some final thoughts um on that point or if brian said it all we can leave it there i think i just one final thing sorry maybe it's a bit left field going back to brian's point about it's actually the reward profile that's also going to bring uh, institutions into the space Connected to that, therefore, is the health and activity in the ecosystem more broadly, because that, of course, drives transaction fees and MEV rewards that are available to validators. So that also means that when people stake, they are invested in the whole ecosystem moving forward and developing a real economy, as it were. All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, appreciate it. I know we have another panel on deck and we've been running a bit over. So um, very much uh, looking forward to seeing the panel that's up next. And thank you all for taking the time to do this this afternoon. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye.
right. What a great panel here. Very on point, topical. Um, so thank you so much, Alison and Brian, Ernie, Kuan. Um, really good discussion. Um, very, very great points there. And I think we all got a lot of alpha there on the second compliance. Now uh, we have next uh, a panel on staking innovations. Specifically, we're going to talk about DVT and restaking. So we'll explore how the Ethereum staking innovations can drive institutional adoption and how to prevent potential risks of centralization that may arise with those. So I'm super excited um, to have as a moderator of that panel today, Felix Lutsch from Chorus One, um, always at the edge of innovation, um, one of the first to lead liquid staking initiatives and always working on the next big thing, basically. Uh, joined by Ushin from Obo, uh, helping investors and stakers to run distributed validators with less than 32 ETH with the Obo network. Um, and Elon from SSV Network as well, building the SSV Network, aiming to make staking more accessible with DVT technology as well. Um, and last but not least, we have Sriram from Eigenlayer, building the restaking protocol uh, that brings additional utility to staking. So I'm super excited for the discussion today. Please kick it off, Felix. Yeah, thanks, Mirko, for the introduction. And thanks, Staking Rewards, for hosting. Really excited to have the last panel here today and talk about some of the uh, uh, most interesting like projects that we, we have here and the innovations in, in staking, which obviously is a very interesting topic. So I thought to like kick off, uh, maybe we can just do like a little bit of intro on the people on this panel. So uh, maybe you can introduce yourselves and uh, the project, your project and what kind of problem it's tackling. Maybe we start with, with Elon. Hey everyone, uh, great to be here. Uh, hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm the founder at one of the founders at SSV. Um, SSV is a DVT network. DVT stands for Distributed uh, Validator Tech. Um, what we aim to do is to help uh, with the Ethereum decentralization efforts and uh, security. DVT enables the split of an Ethereum validator into independent operators. Those operators know. Uh, to coordinate with one another uh, through the SSV uh, uh, protocol. Um, and we're very focused on developers. Uh, our idea is that in the next few years, we'll see a huge amount of innovation around um, staking services and protocols. And those, all of them need infrastructure to uh, run them. And so SSV uh, aims to be that infrastructure. Yeah, maybe Sriram, you can go next. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Shri Ram. <clears throat> I'm founder at Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer is a mechanism for allowing Ethereum stakers to participate in validating other services. Imagine services like uh, data storage, data availability, oracles, fast proof verifications. You know, uh, these could be ecosystem allied services for the Ethereum ecosystem. They may also be something as distinct as I want the Ethereum stakers to go run a new chain. So that's that's what we're trying to do is to expand the scope of what staking means. Instead of when you're staking, you're subscribing to a preset uh, rule set, which is the Ethereum protocol. You have the freedom to opt in to any of these new uh, innovations that can then be built on top of this common trust network. So yeah, very excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, Oshin, Please. longest hair, last. Please. Yeah, I'll go for it. <laughs> um, hi, Felix. Nice to meet you. My name is Oshin Kain. I'm CTO and co-founder here at Oba Labs. My background is in, in software development, software architecture. I've been in the crypto space since about 2018. Um, previously, I worked in Consensus and in Block Demon, where I would have built their ETH2 staking platform for them. Um, as Oval, what do we do? We work on decentralizing and distributing validators. Um, we focus in particular on trying to reduce the risks of validators, liquid staking protocols, and broadly help to make Ethereum proof of stake more resilient and more decentralized. Because, yeah, without distributed validators, I think we'll end up in a scenario where things kind of agglomerate rather than decentralize. And yeah, that's me. All right. Awesome. So yeah, the, the topic of this entire day is sort of institutional ETH staking. So I thought like uh, to kick off with a question around that. So maybe uh, each of you can share your thoughts on 
in general the the idea of institutional participation and staking where you where you think we're at and maybe also what do you think the impact will be on on the decentralization of the ethereum network or in general proof of stake um yeah maybe Elon, you can start again yeah, sure um i think um institutional staking is um is going, we'll see much more of it. And the reason why is I always looked at Ethereum staking as a, as a low risk, low reward type of mechanism um, with the best kind of uh, description of it because um, it's, it's low risk because if you're already holding Ethereum, then you're not exposed to the Ethereum volatility. You just need to opt into staking. And obviously Ethereum has a big enough community. So a lot of people would want to do that. From the institutional point of view, if you're long on Ethereum, that is, you want to hold Ethereum uh, for a long period of time, it makes a lot of sense to uh, opt into staking. Uh, and obviously, institutions have probably the, the deepest pockets in the industry. Um, now, that's amazing because each Ether coming in secures Ethereum better, and it also um, enables institutions to participate in securing Ethereum, which is something they were... Uh, not really able to do before. So it, it engages them with the, with the protocol in the community. The problem is how you do that, because if you centralize a lot of that staking into very few entities, uh, you increase the risk on the staker, but you also increase the risk of everyone else holding Ethereum. Um, you know, you can think of various scenarios where centralized entities will, uh, will get compromised. And we saw that uh, and we'll continue seeing that that's the nature of, of, of people. And so I think that uh, we need to be very careful about it, but we also need to recognize that there's a lot of capital in institutions and that capital will want to participate in staking. Um, and so that's both a, an opportunity, but it's, it's a major challenge as well. Yeah, one of the things that I think will be a big feature of institutional staking as it kind of comes online is starting to look at staking as an interest rate and as even an Ethereum bond. Um, I think interest rates dictate how a lot of institutions, particularly like long lived ones, finance themselves and invest their capital. And I think particularly as the technology and risk come down that it gets easier to do and broadly even becomes, you know, available to stake in dollars, I think that will, you know, broadly impact how institutions come into the space. But yeah, I, I broadly think of staking as kind of an interest rate on your like token. So if you're already allocating it, you're going to be looking at these and evaluating the risk trade-offs between whether we, you know, stake as a normal validator with a distributed validator, whether we opt into restaking and, you know, change those yields even further. Um, that's, yeah, interest rates, I think, will be the, the real kind of thing that attracts institutional money. Yeah, I mostly agree. Uh, I think uh, one dimension that I want to add is the uh, ability of institutions to express their different uh, reward preferences and risk preferences is something that restaking will bring into the platform. That different, and not only that, like the heterogeneous computational abilities, I think you should not forget that, that like different kinds of staking uh, operators have different amounts of computational abilities. And, you know, when you can, uh, when you're staking ETH, if you can provide additional computational power to power more applications, that that's something that's definitely interesting. Uh, there's also a flip side to this, which I think Alan and Marshall also pointed out, which is the decentralization. How do we make sure that as a network, there is no major externalities to due to these things? And, one way we think about it is it's not just right now that the stakers are unable to express their rich preferences. Services which want to be secured are also unable to express their preferences. There may be services which want very decentralized validation, and there may be services which just want economic stake backing the statements because whatever statements that are being made are backed by some amount of stake. So there'll be different kinds of services. And right now, the expressivity in decentralization trust is minimal. We, you just get Ethereum security, whatever that means, as a bundle. Instead, the ability to unbundle this and say that some services will want more decentralized validation. Some services will want more centralized validation because they just care about how much economic stake is at uh, risk. So these are all dynamics that we're very excited about seeing how it will play out. I think uh, if I can uh, kind of extend that idea of risk, I think that it's very hard to assess risk or, or, or compute it. 
Uh, we saw that recently with uh, SVB and we saw that previously with Celsius and others. Um, if staking in itself is low risk, it doesn't mean that your position in staking is low risk, uh, depending on the instrument you're using. And so I think that the more we can have a solid ground uh, infrastructure, basically, to stand on, um, we can lower that risk. And that's very, very significant, especially if we're thinking that, you know, post Shanghai, uh, we'll see a significant increase um, in, in staking. I think that's instead of cooking up the next big drop or the next big uh, issue, uh, we should be thinking how to solve that because that, if, if that hits, uh, it's going to hit Ethereum at a very fundamental level as well. Right, I think you're you're already getting into some of my next questions, which which is great. I think uh, just thinking about your project in the context of like basically this institutional adoption or generally staking, right? Could you expand a bit how it uh, maybe helps bring more adoption to staking and then just generally grow the staking economy? Who should start? Whoever wants, maybe Ocean. Sure. Um, so yeah, one of the big things that I think we alluded to with Shanghai and exits coming along is kind of de-risking staking. I think when we talk about, you know, institutions having kind of a big question mark as to when they might be able to withdraw has been kind of a no-go for most of them. Um, broadly, and on a similar note in terms of where Obal can help, a lot of these institutions, particularly the fund types, they have certain rules around what they can and can't invest in. That, you know, usually just talks about things like um, SOC 2 compliance and like some of these different security kind of levels of compliance. But it also, some of these funds have um, things about how many kind of operators they can use and where, where they're, what jurisdiction they're in and what sort of controls you have over these things. And broadly with something like distributed validator technology, a lot of these institutional spaces haven't been able to kind of wade into the like liquid staking protocols or tokens. They don't have enough control over who's staking their funds and, you know, whether or not they're KYC or, you know, whether or not the machines are in Germany to comply with GDPR, for example. But if you have something like OBOL and distributed validators, um, the other one being like the distributed validator, you have to put all your money with one entity. You can divide it across a number of them. But what you have, yeah, control over with something like Obel is you can say, here are my entities. I know who they are. I trust them. They're all in a jurisdiction. I've kind of prearranged with them. And, and this is kind of some of the many things that institutions need to get comfortable with the likes of staking, as opposed to being able to kind of go, oh, I don't know. I'll you know buy it in Uniswap and I'll ask too many questions about where it came from or who's staking it or what the risk profile is or where it's taxed or any of these kind of things. Um, I think that um, I'm, I'm a developer. I've uh, been the last uh, 20 years a developer, so I'm, a, I'm very much a believer that developers change the world. And so we're very much focused on those developers, regardless of the ultimately the service or protocol they're developing. Uh, because ultimately, for the most part, 90% um, of stakers will interact with a service and not do it themselves, I think. Um, and so for both of them, uh, developers, they're looking for basically two things. They're looking for reusable infrastructure that is reliable that they can tap into very quickly, and they're using and and they want an ecosystem to you know plug themselves into. You know, it's the old saying that uh, if a developer takes more than two minutes to figure out the quick start, uh, it's too late. Uh, and so I think that that's that's the two things that developers are looking for, regardless of what they they developing. It could be a developer at Coinbase, and it can be a developer in a, in a two person startup. Uh, they are both developers and they're thinking uh, the same, uh, obviously different constraints and so on. But And so I think with our design, with that, what, what SSV tries to bring along is um, DVT as a network. Uh, and that network can both be reusable uh, because it's a network. It, it's there uh, before you start using it and after you start using it. And so you can tap into it very, very quickly and an ecosystem to go along with it of developers and, and, and analytics and, and explorers and all of the bits and bytes you need. I always give this example where, you know, you can it, it, try to, to imagine Ethereum without Etherscan. Uh, you know, it's still the same Ethereum, say, same EVM, uh, but it's a whole different place, right? So Ethereum, uh, Etherscan is a, is, is a big part in the Ethereum ecosystem. And so that goes along uh, significantly. So those are the two things we're focused and that's where kind of the junction we want to see ourselves in. 
Um, maybe I can add a little bit of, of our own view here. Um, you see staking as a mechanism for supplying decentralized trust, right? So that's really fundamentally what, what you're doing here. And, you know, Alan alluded to like, you know, being developer focused. One of the things we have, uh, you know, we take a strong bet on is if your core value of staking is to supply decentralized trust, we need to expand the service of innovators who can consume that decentralized trust. And by expanding it, you're provisioning your trust to a lot more interesting developers who will come up with interesting ideas, which will take this like blockchain ecosystem to the next 1 billion people. Um, I want to also, you know, since we touched upon risk a bit here, I want to like mention that validation uh, is a different kind of risk. And all, all three of us building products here, you know, and either in DVT or in Eigenlayer are building validation products. Validation is a different risk profile than DeFi or other things. Validation is a risk you can control, you can mitigate, you can do better by using, for example, DVT and other technologies. The idea is when you're doing, when you're supplying your capital to like participate in validation, if you do all the things right, your chance of losing that stake can be very small. This is very, very different. Even if you opt into 10, 20 different networks, as long as you do the due diligence and work for each of them, you can actually reduce your risk to be very minimal, which is very, very different from if you go take a 10x leverage on a margin lending platform, right? The price moves by 10%, then you get liquidated. It's a very different thing. And people kind of like mix up the concepts of risk emerging from these two domains. And they're not at all the same. Like I can, you know, if I'm a good validator and I know how to run it, I can run 10 different services consistently and correctly. And it's in my control as a validator. Whereas if I take a 10X margin position, I will get liquidated without my control because I don't control market price. And I think this is just uh, educating like the broader staking ecosystem on what types of risk we are talking about and what technologies are available to mitigate these risks and what due diligence one can do to actually put these operations in practice. I think it's something we have to do better as a community. I definitely David. agree. Yeah, go for it. Oh, I, I definitely agree. I think that in each uh, vertical that we, you know, we, you have in the Ethereum ecosystem and other ecosystems as well, you always start with simple and stupid and always progress to something super sophisticated but very, very secure because, you know, it's it's the way of life, right? I mean, at the beginning, it's very easy because nobody does it and, and nobody really knows better. So, and everyone does it, but it's very hard to distinguish between very risky, very technical, right decisions and so on. And then you start evolving. So, you know, if you take, for example, wallets in the in this space, right? It used to be the case that people printed it out on a piece of paper. That was the, you know, best technology available. And obviously that that's not good. And then... Uh, mnemonic was invented and so on and, and hardware wallets and so it became significantly more complicated but also significantly more uh, risk-free or, or less risky and more more um, uh, it opened up to everyone because it was very structured and so on and i think staking is going through the same process uh, you know uh, spinning up a, a validator is, is is not that easy but you know if you have a bit of uh, understanding of how clis work you you'll make it but it doesn't mean that you're running it well and so if you add on those you know different ways of doing it better um, and more secure and, and, and giving the people who understand the technology to make the decisions and build on top of them, um, then you'll find yourself with a much better product. And so I, 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 I think risk is the key for everything here. Yeah, the comment I was gonna make that kind of built on Shreer, I'm saying of saying there's the type of risk where it's like you're exposing a, a trade to someone like there, you know, there's an APR and that implies risk. That's kind of, one type of risk and yeah, the other side is kind of the black swan risk of failures and the example i was going to give was it's like kind of usdc went off peg and people were kind of speculating on returning to peg on oiler and you know being like oh i this rate and i, I lose this much of it goes to plan and not to plan and then the black swan risk that people didn't really think into account that the platform itself had an issue so yeah sometimes we we hear a lot of like liquid staking protocols people are kind of eyeballing this percent or that APR percent being like, oh, I get 1% more here. But that like non-linearity of risk is what humans are very bad at. And it's also what we as people building software need to be super cautious of is not introducing that like kind of black swan, alter zero risk um, 
kind of along the way and, and that's kind of I guess you know more relevant than ever this week yeah don't trust centralized banking that's the highest risk mm. or one software platform that's going to do it all right yeah. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, yeah, very good points. I, I think, you know, uh, I find interesting, I guess, Riram, you mentioned when uh, that it's basically like there's very low risk, risk, even if you would like run a lot of restaking services. Um, but maybe are there also limitations in terms of, let's say, I'm a solo staker. Can I even run like this many services? And maybe then also, I guess, a question for you and also like for the others on the panel, since I sort of think DVT kind of fits into that story where can can somehow people get together, maybe even to to run like these restaking services together and sort of um, not run the risk of centralizing too much with, let's say, an operator that can run, um, you know, a lot of restaking services on their on their big machines that maybe a home staker is not not able to do. Yeah, this is a very important question, and I think you know uh, needs a lot of work for us to address. Uh, I want to just state two things that we are doing from our end, and I think we would like to engage closer with the community to do some of the other things. The first thing is um, anticipating and building services that do not require a lot of hardware to run. Okay, so. There are services which are trust constrained, not operations constrained, right? Like an Oracle price feed, right? It's trust constrained. It is not, you know, computation constrained. Like one could very easily run it on a small node. We're building data availability to also be like that, which is every node downloads very little because it does this data availability sampling. Whereas, you know, together, they are able to check a huge amount of data. So that's another example. You can... Uh, so as we start thinking through the new classes of infrastructure services that are needed for the Ethereum ecosystem, what we need to think about uh, as a community is what are mechanisms that many light nodes together can offer a service that is very, very powerful. Like I'll give another example, which is, you know, we see a routine bridging hacks and other things happen between across ecosystems. And running light nodes of other chains is actually a very lightweight task off chain. But when you want to run it on the Ethereum inside EVM, it can be extraordinarily expensive, right? The gas costs associated with that. But running it off-chain is actually pretty easy. So, you know, can nodes run like light lines of other chains and certify that the state is actually uh, correct off-chain and then make the claims on Ethereum? So these are all examples of what we call lightweight or scalable services. And we this is one thing we are doing. Uh, you know, this is why... We didn't. We could have launched like last year, just saying that we accept one liquid staking derivative, and then you just take fork Solana and then just run it on top of the uh, whoever wants to restake. is very easy to do, uh, but we want to take a cautious approach in maximizing the benefit to the community. So that's number one. Number two, like I said, there'll be services which simply want only the decentralized validator set. You know, imagine things like secret sharing. I take a secret, split it into small chunks and spread it across many nodes so that many nodes have to come together in order to reveal the data. If you if you took this and took it to a system where only one node has put down all the capital and basically all the secret chats lie with the same node. So you basically have unattributable flaws. And so decentralization is the only protection. So I think this is a place, and I think you suggested Felix, this really interesting idea that can we bring ideas like TVT to have many nodes to work together, maybe they're not doing redundant tasks like they're doing right now in DVT, but they're doing like complementary tasks, but they're sharing trust through this network. I think these are fascinating ideas that we need to explore as a community. Yeah, I would also echo the importance of making it such that it's not dependent on any particular one node. So the likes of distributed validators, if they are, you know, providing a service for some entities, they're like, yeah, for like all in on one node, that's fine. But it's, you know, much easier both from a decentralization of the network, if nothing else, perspective to say, oh, you know, if you're online, if you're offline, don't worry, you're in a group of four of you with EFG consensus. One of you can fail at any one time. It really, um, yeah, reduces the kind of risk, like, for example, of an Oracle update. You're like, oh, you know, so long as not all of you fail or so long as we have the threshold, we get the prices through that, you know, in and of itself is 
uh, an extra kind of layer of risk reduction versus saying, oh yeah, there's five of you and you fail, you know, you succeed or fail on your own versus as a group. I see David is telling us to give, take some audience questions. Um, okay, I, I think actually I also wanted to take it like into like a direction where now we talked a lot about sort of like adoption of Ethereum, mistaking and um, decentralization. I, I kind of wanted to like hear from you guys since you're like a project of yourself, right? That basically seeks to, to build a community of its own. How do you actually approach decentralization of your own project? Uh, maybe, yeah, um, Elon, you can start. Yeah. I think um, fr from the start, we were thinking about, uh, you know, if you're building something decentralized for Ethereum, uh, you, you need to be very community driven uh, because ultimately a community is not just people that work together, but it's also a way to distribute uh, power and distribute uh, decision making and be a safeguard for different things. So, you know, if, if you have a community deciding things for the protocol, um, uh, you know, for parameters all the way to major decisions, then um, then it's a much healthier approach, obviously, if it's successful, uh, than having a centralized entity deciding everything. Because, ult again, ultimately, um, you know, if, if you go, you know, a year into the future, many people are using BVT and so on and so forth. If you have a centralized, um, you know, company that, that holds the code and can do whatever it wants and change the parameters and change the, the rules of the game, uh, you're dependent on that company. But if you have a community with an open source, you know, kind of public good type of, of project, then the community has the resources and also the ability to move forward with things that not necessarily the core team agrees with. Now, you know, you, you can you can take it into the more aggressive part and, and say, you know, there's going to be a lot of fighting and so on. But that's part of the deal. Uh, that's definitely part of the deal. Um, and, and so I think that. It's not just about building the software or the protocol. You need to understand the implications on Ethereum itself, especially if you're building something which is infrastructural for Ethereum. If, if, if the Ethereum ecosystem relies in some way on your service, it needs to be very um, kind of echo the, you know, what Ethereum is, kind of the ethos of Ethereum itself, right? And the ethos of Ethereum itself is that it's very it's 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 bound to be very distributed um you know you have the the main figures in ethereum nobody takes uh or, or reduces vitalik's role in ethereum uh but the ethereum today is so robust with so many clients so many teams so many researchers um then it means that it's robust into the future so it could be the world computer right uh versus ethereum which is you know a single entity that makes all the decisions and so that's kind of the, the one of the major, major first steps we did for, towards centralization is to understand that you need to reduce your own power um, and your own control, even if it means um, short term, um, more complexity, but long term, maybe a healthier ecosystem. Yeah, I think the main thing that kind of I think about when it comes to decentralizing is what Elon alluded to around um, assuming anyone can unwind without you if you were gone in the morning you shouldn't be kind of keeping up crucial infrastructure that they need or they should be able to unwind and go back to a normal validator and stuff and yeah similarly when it comes to like software and vulnerabilities no software is perfect nothing can't fail you have to more or less presume that anything could be compromised so you're like okay if this bit is malicious how bad is it if this bit is malicious how bad is it and you know always take those option threads stay away from private keys, stay away from having kind of total control, being in charge of, you know, the networking or different pieces and always working under the assumption that it's, if we were bad actors in the morning or gone in the morning, you know, will everything be fine? Does people have a, a step down? That kind of thing. That's kind of the biggest way I can see to be decentralized. Um, we are definitely aligned on the broad thesis here, I think, as a community. The one reason uh, I think Alan mentioned this idea of Ethereum as the world computer, my own mental model is Ethereum is the digital commons. So it's the commons where we all meet. And anybody building common infrastructure on the commons um, needs to build it in a, as neutral a manner as possible. So we are also committed to the same vision. Uh, there's always this step from going from the idea originating in a small group and then it has to disseminate broader, more people need to buy into it, 
then more people need to participate in it and then have proper governance rights embedded in it. So there is a series of steps going from the initial idea, which usually arises in small groups, to then becoming part of the commons. So we are definitely committed to that process. Um, there is a layer of like commons, which is which needs credible neutrality, but there is also a layer of permissionless innovation on top. We do not think every innovation that is built on top of Ethereum needs to have the same common governance structure. Where trust originates needs to have a credible innovation, credible neutrality. But services built on top don't necessarily need to have the same like decentralization. So this is what I call as the separation between innovation and trust. So trust comes from somewhere that needs to be credibly neutral. But Innovations can themselves take opinionated viewpoints. Otherwise, we will not have the rate of progress that we need to actually build this ecosystem if everything is log jammed by governance. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to take a nuanced view as to what layers need to be credibly neutral and what layers we want to accelerate permissionless innovation by opinionated groups. And I think my mental model for this is wherever network effects accrue, those are much better built at the credibly neutral layer. Yeah, we, we literally had a discussion around that on Twitter <laughs> today. Um, I, I totally agree. I think that um, you have to have innovation, and innovation means you know failure uh, for ninety nine percent of the time. And so um, I definitely agree that uh, we, we should keep that separation. That is, Ethereum needs to do what Ethereum is best at, and building kind of the you know the scaffolding for everything. But ultimately, the applications and, and kind of the risk taking should be done by, by individual projects, because otherwise you will not be able to move forward and quickly enough. Uh, you know, you have uh, and, and it's kind of, uh, you know, heartbreaking to say, but one of the main challenges today with Bitcoin uh, and, and by challenges, I, uh, you know, I speak very lightly, is that it's stuck. It's basically stuck. It's, it's so fragile that everyone afraid to touch it, that it just stays in time. Uh, and that's very, very dangerous. Um, I, I think that Ethereum should be keep on running and, de and developing and doing interesting things with a decreasing velocity. And on, on the up, on the flip side, you'll see more and more projects building things, you know, uh, aside of Ethereum, on top of Ethereum, and so on, with accelerating uh, velocity. Um, and that's going to be the the you know the, the the great thing about it. And and that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, I'm still thinking about what Trion said about um, the things that net network effects should be low trust and immutable. And a part of me is wondering which comes first, the, the network effects or the like low trust. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's a new, new chicken and egg problem. <laughs> yeah, do you trust it because it's immutable or is it immutable because you trust it? All right. Um, I think we're like sort of already over time. And uh, thanks everyone that was watching like for almost four hours, it seems. I hope like there was someone that, that did that or otherwise watch the recordings. Um, and thanks for my amazing panelists and, and for the great conversation. I think I just wanted to wrap it up with like one final question, short question. Uh, since we're like been talking a lot about Ethereum, I guess maybe um, was wondering if, if for you guys, is there some plan also to go uh, beyond Ethereum with your technology or is it sort of like uh, uh, Ethereum only um, approach that you're you're doing? If you can share that, I'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly. I think we are uh, pretty Ethereum centric, uh, even though because the amount of decentralization, decentralization, and like um, staking that is available in is, in Ethereum is pretty large, and supplying decentralized trust from Ethereum to other things is what we are actually kind of focusing on. But, you know, since, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin was brought up here, I want to give a shout out to one of our like friendly projects, Babylon, which is trying to move trust from Bitcoin to Cosmos zones, where like zones can borrow trust from Bitcoin to to the extent possible. So that that's something interesting. And I hope like a lot more of these innovations come, which essentially work on the paradigm of how to support innovators and borrow trust. Because I think this is the superpower when we talk about the pseudonymous economy. It's possible for, for somebody to be a pseudonym because they themselves don't need to be trusted. Somebody else is underwriting the trust. And I think this is such a powerful paradigm. And uh, yeah, hope to see more of these projects.
Yeah, I think on our side, we have done some thinking about it. We also quite like the kind of work that's going on in Cosmos. Um, I think we're to some extent waiting to see when the like right time is. There's obviously a lot of moving pieces in terms of interchain security and mesh security and the likes. Um, other places as well, if there's obviously a lot of Ethereum forks that you know did different things in the proof of work era that are kind of rethinking their consensus and seeing what they can do. And then even in the Ethereum native ecosystem, there's a huge amount of places where there are validators or points of trust where you can, you know, rethink these security assumptions if you can make it a group working together with fault tolerance instead of one single entity or, you know, you can opt people into slashing conditions that they currently are not opted into, for example. But yeah, there's quite a lot of places where there's trusted entities that can be kind of mitigated, you know, inside Ethereum and outside. Uh, we are very Ethereum focused. Um, so, um, yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you soon in the Staking Summit in Thank person, you. maybe. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much, Thank Felix. Alex, for doing this. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, Felix, and uh, all the uh, participants, Ushi, Nalon, and Sriram, for the great panel. Um, closing this off today on the Second Innovations. It's been an uh, amazing event today. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. It's been uh, really great. Uh, so much alpha and amazing discussions today. Make sure to like uh, check the recaps. Um, we have everything recorded, and we'll post the panels individually on YouTube later. Make sure to follow at stakingwords.com on Twitter. And thanks again to our sponsors as well, ClayStack, a leading liquid staking solution in the space, and EtherFi, one of the hottest non-custodial liquid staking protocols, um, which just launched in beginning of March as well. So uh, yeah, really excited, and make sure to also tune in for the staking summit in person, which we announced yesterday for Istanbul on the 10th and 11th of November. Um, we have just released early bird tickets there, um, so make sure you don't miss them, and um, that being said, um, this was a great event. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for uh, the entire team organizing it. Um, and thanks for everyone tuning in. So happy staking.